it's fine. fine. Yeah. Uh, and put the result in, uh, in, in the ballot box. The ballot box is over there, but I will give it a more prominent position before the end of the session. Uh, so we collect all those, uh, all those votes, and then uh, we will announce the winner uh, later today during the award session. So uh, that was the message, and uh, now I give the floor to the session chair of today. Thank you. Good morning. Um, excuse my voice. Uh, last year's audio canteen was a bit tempting. Um, 
this will be the last paper session of HPG, and the title of it is GPU computing. And I would like to uh, uh, introduce um, the first paper of today, um, GPU, uh, GPU, acceleration, uh, GPU accelerated LOD generation for point clouds, um, where Marco Schütz shows a, a point voxel uh, oak tree which allows him to filter colors and also um, render them very fast. So please give some applause for Marco Schütz. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see so many people made it here after yesterday. Um, yeah, I'm going to present the GPU accelerated LOD generation for point clouds. And two of my co-authors, Bernhard and Philip, they're also here today. Uh, they've been great help for this paper here. So the problem that we're trying to solve here is um, we have point cloud data sets with just a couple of million points up to hundreds of billions of points. And if you have um, a very large amount of points, it takes quite a while to generate an LOD structure out of that. And we wanted to figure out how fast can you do that on a GPU, because the state of the art uh, mostly revolves around doing that on a CPU for point clouds. So this is the structure that we're generating with our method. Uh, it's an octree where we have voxels in inner nodes and the original um, point cloud data in the leaf nodes. So the root node looks like this here. Uh, it's a very coarse voxel representation of the whole point cloud. Then you can uh, replace one octant of the um, uh, root node with a higher detailed child node. And at some point, if you zoom in very closely to this model, you might eventually want to render the original point cloud data which is stored in the leaf nodes. Um, it's important to note that this is that we target surface models. So even though we use voxels, um, it's not nothing volumetric. It's also not solid voxel models. It's really just the voxels on the surface of the model. Um, during the generation, we do have a sampling grid um, with a size of 128 to the power of three voxels. But this sampling grid is only needed um, when we uh, generate uh, the, the voxels for a node, and then it's discarded right away afterwards. Instead, we store the voxels in a vertex buffer uh, using their coordinates and their color values. Also, uh, during rendering, we're targeting rendering about pixel-sized voxels. So what you see here is not really what you get for rendering, because the voxels are just one pixel large, or maybe two times two pixels, if you need some more rendering performance. So uh, let's have a look at some state-of-the-art things. Um, to the left, layered point clouds, uh, it's um, a structure, a binary tree where we have subsets of points in each of these nodes. So for example, a random subset uh, with uh, about 500 to 8,000 points per node, and there are no duplicates. So when you combine all the points in all nodes, you get back the original data structure. Um, this is fast to generate, also quite fast to render. There's only one problem, you don't have, uh, you don't have redundancy, um, which means you don't have representative data in inner nodes. Vandedal have addressed this by um, using a, a very similar structure, but the original point clouds, they are stored in the leaf nodes, and in the inner nodes you have some quantized representation, some representative data, uh, it could be points, circles, or voxels in the inner nodes. And um, there's one figure of this paper, in this case here they use uh, circles. Um, in our paper we use basically the same structure, but with voxels, or we generate this structure. There's also a modifiable nested octree, uh, which is, which is kind of similar to both of them. Um, like the layered point clouds, it has no duplicate data, so all the points are distributed in, at each level of the hierarchy. It also uses a sampling grid, like the structure from Wanderdahl, uh, in order to get a more uniform subsample in inner nodes. Um, and it also uses an octree. And there's the structure from uh, Kaidas et al., uh, which also uses voxels in lower levels of detail. But uh, the, uh, instead of points, they have the full resolution triangle model in the leaf nodes. So um, state of the art in LOD construction, uh, so this kind of throughputs here. So for example, about two and a half million to uh, 11 million points per second. So if you have a structure with billions of points, it can still take quite a while in order to generate a level of detail structure. So, this is what we do on a GPU now to make this faster. We have our input point cloud, and the first thing we do is we split it, uh, split all the points into leaf nodes with, with at most 50,000 points. And then the next step, we populate the inner nodes, the still empty inner nodes, with voxel representations from the bottom up. 
Um, this is how we do the splitting um, efficiently. We use a hierarchical counting sort. And with a hierarchical counting sort, we can generate an octree with a depth of eight levels with just two iterations over all the points. And what we need for counting sort is a counting grid. And we need one counter for each potential leaf node at the highest level of the octree. And in our case, that means we need a counting grid with a size of 256 to the power of three. And then we count all the points of our uh, data set into the cells here. Um, yeah, once we've done the counting, we basically have our octree structure where we know the amount of points in the leaf nodes. The problem uh, right now is that we generate a structure that's used for rasterization. And for rasterization, we want to have a, a certain batch size of points in the node. So if we have nodes with very few points, we then start merging these nodes into um, a lower levels of the hierarchy in order to get much, uh, larger batch sizes. Uh, with the goal to have nodes with less than 50,000 points, but also not too many, too small nodes. So at some point, we have the, uh, the, the second to the right, where we merged all the points here. And this basically gives us the full octree hierarchy with knowledge about the number of points in the leaf nodes. And at that point, we can allocate the right amount of memory for each leaf node. And then we iterate a second time through all the points in order to insert them into uh, the leaf nodes. OK, so now we have this uh, structure in the middle where we have the points in the leaf nodes. And we have to populate the empty inner nodes with voxelized representations. We do that by picking an empty node, creating a um, sampling grid with the size of 128. And we then add all the points and voxels from the child nodes into the sampling grid. Then we extract the voxels from the sampling grid and store them into a vertex buffer. Here's what this uh, sampling grid looks like. Uh, there are several strategies that you can use to compute the color. Um, very fast and uh, simple is the first come strategy. So the first point that hits a voxel cell um, generates a voxel, and the color from this point is used as a voxel color. Um, this is a bit of a problem because it's biased towards um, earlier points in your data set. Uh, a little better is a random strategy where you pick one random point in a voxel. And uh, better than that, still average and weighted uh, sampling strategies. So yeah, for the first come strategy, the nice thing is that we only need one bit per cell in the sampling grid. And this one bit tells us if this voxel is already occupied or not. And um, in the end, uh, the sampling grid for, uh, takes about 32 kil kilobytes, which fits in shared memory. And it's also one of the reasons why this is fast. If we do the random sampling, we need more bits than that. Um, in our case, we use an um, integer where we have a random number component and a component that stores the index of the point that we're adding to this voxel grid. And we then do an atomic max and uh, sample with the largest random numbers accepted. And then we can extract the um, index in there to get the sample that was accepted. At the bottom here, um, you can see what this sampling looks like. So we have some surface well, that's mostly green, but there are some red dots in there as well. Problem with the first and the random sampling strategies is that it happens quite frequently that you uh, pick a non-representative sample here. So even though these red points are very subtle in the surface, in the voxelized representation, they are um, too visible. So with the average strategy, that gets a little better. Uh, you average all the points within a cell. But it's still a problem that if the surface doesn't nicely intersect or barely intersects with a voxel, then we might end up picking an unsuitable point here. And with the weighted average strategy, we take into consideration, into consideration all the points in the vicinity of the voxel, including points in neighboring voxels. And then we weight their color by the distance. Um, of course, we also want to make this um, parallel here on the GPU. So what we do is when we have this structure where we have all the points in the leaf nodes, the first thing you do now is we create a list of all the bottommost nodes um, that are still empty. And we can uh, process each of these nodes in parallel. And we use one group, work group per node to process that in parallel on the GPU. But we also make sure that we don't spawn too many work groups because each work group needs a sampling grid in order to voxelize uh, this node or create a voxel representation. And each of these uh, sample grids uh, requires 32 megabytes, so it's quite sizable. So what we do, one workgroup um, processes one node, and we spawn as many workgroups as there are streaming multiprocessors on a GPU. And with that, we need about 2.7 gigabytes for the sampling grids on an uh, RTX 3090. And all of these workgroups, they then loop through the unprocessed nodes until eventually all of the nodes are processed. 
So the results regarding performance uh, is we can construct this structure at a rate of about two to five billion points per second with the first um, come or the random strategy. Uh, with average strategy, it's about two billion points per second and with the weighted average, about one billion points per second. And compared to the CPU-based state of the art, so we are about um, 80 to 400 times faster than that. Um, we benchmark one of that um, on a uh, CPU, which is an out-of-core process. So it loads data from disk and then processes it. So we benchmark it from RAM disk in order to make sure that um, this file I.O. is not a limiting factor here. But yeah, about 100 times faster usually. Um, this is what the different sampling strategy uh, then produce here. So what you see are uh, already the voxels, just one pixel per voxel. And with the first and random strategy, um, they look very similar, but they have some big 80s and issues. With the average and weighting strategy, uh, both of that get better, and you can actually kind of almost read what's written in there, unlike the first two strategies. Um, the first come strategy and has a problem that is biased towards earlier points in the data set. So it can spectacularly fail in some data sets with uh, not very good ordering, where, uh, or not nice ordering for our case, where you uh, were ordered for scan position, some scan earlier, some scan later, and somehow you pick the earlier scan all the time. The random strategy makes that a little better, even better the average strategy. And um, the average strategy still has the problem that if the surface is not nicely aligned, with the voxel grid, you get some weird artifacts here, and the weighted strategy um, improves it uh, a little further. So here's a video of what the LOD structure looks like. We have this octree node here. We can reduce the level of detail. Usually if you do that, um, holes will start to appear. What you could do is render the voxels then as boxes or as quads on screen in order to fill these holes here. Here's another video that I um, just reused from last year. Uh, last year it was about rendering this kind of LOD structure fast. And uh, in this case here, this data set with 520 million points, um, it can be rendered in real time in virtual reality at 90 frames per second um, by uh, reducing the amount of points that we actually rendered thanks to the level of detail structure. So yeah, um, of course there are uh, several limitations. And one is for example that with the averaging, we uh, improved uh, some of the worst aliasing um, artifacts, but it's still not great. Um, also, you have to combine it with um, some blending, some high quality shading, where you blend together overlapping points, because it, uh, it's not a replacement for that. It just makes it better, because blending alone cannot produce a nice result if the blended colors are a bad uh, selection. Also, uh, to make things even better, the colors should um, depend on a few direction, because for example, if you do the voxel representations and uh, you create a voxel of two sides of a wall, then this wall collapses into one single voxel and you have the same color for both sides. So at some point, you, there should be something that uh, considers that and uses something like um, spherical harmonics, for example, to do the right color for the right direction. It's also not yet out of core, but um, there's really no problem to include this into an out of core process because they usually do um, some chunking first anyway, and then you could apply this on the chunks that you've generated. Also, um, it's important to note that this structure uh, is for performance. So it's you know, for handling large amounts of LiDAR data quickly, create a LOD structure quickly, render a massive geometry quickly, but it's not for quality. Um, the underlying data doesn't really allow for quality. It's just simple points with a color. Uh, there's no surface normal, there is no uh, extent of this kind of point, so you will get holes if you zoom in. So if you want the quality, you probably still have to use textured meshes or something like surface or Gaussian splats. There are some potential implementation improvements that you could also use. For example, um, we've used 2.7 gigabytes for the sampling grids, and there are some ways to reduce it uh, to 160 megabytes. For example, instead of 128, you could use 64 and reuse it eight times for all the ch children that you sample in a node. Also, one of the reviewers rightfully uh, remarked that um, instead of using one integer per color channel or for a counter, we could use a little less bits. For example, we could use a bit pattern of 18, 18, 18 for the colors and 10 for the counter in order to compute a sum of up to around uh, 1,000 voxels or points. And another low-hanging fruit for implementation is, of course, to quantize the 
uh, the points on the voxels. Right now we always use 16 bytes, even for the voxels, and this is quite wasteful. Also points in the leaf nodes, they have a very small extent, so it's also better to use some kind of uh, fixed precision integer for that. And for future work, um, right now it really makes the processing much, much faster, but very often you're limited by the actual file I.O. So it takes us one second to generate the LOD structure, but it might still take us 60 seconds to actually load it from disk, so you still have to wait a minute until you can view the results. So because of that, we've already been working on turning this into an incremental approach where data is loaded from disk, the octree is updated incrementally, and you can view it right away in real time. So this is where it's currently headed, but both of them have their um, use cases. The top one is much, much faster in terms of throughput, but an incremental approach uh, lets you see things right away. So yeah, with that, thank you for your attention. And if you wanted to take the source code, um, take a look at this link. So thanks a lot for this cool talk. Um, now we have time for questions. Are there questions? Oh, okay. Hope it's on. Hello. Wow, it's nice. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very nice. Uh, you mentioned in the limitations that you didn't do the out of core yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so may I ask, uh, what's the largest size of your testing data and what GPU you use and how much GPU memory you have? Uh, pardon, can you repeat it? Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, I'm saying, like, uh, what's the largest size of your testing uh, uh, The largest data? size we've tested since this is in-core was 1 billion points. And uh, this was on a GPU with 48 gigabytes. So we didn't really do anything memory friendly here. But if you do this in an out-of-core process, then we have data sets with, uh, for example, 6,400 billion points. So if you look at this first slide, there's actually a data set, the right, uh, rightmost one, 640 billion points, and it's from the Netherlands. And even though the resolution is just about 12 points per square meter, so it's not a really high resolution for if you want to do a first-person view, but still you end up with that much data, and with out-of-core you could handle that. Memory or? Uh, no, uh, what you'd have to do is, for example, to do a um, first pass where you create chunks and then you process each chunk um, and you could process each chunk on the GPU, write the results back on disk, and at some point combine all the uh, individual, basically individual octrees that you generated, combine them into one large octree. So that's one way to do that. Is there another question? Thank you, nice talk. Um, I wonder, could you say a few words about like potential discontinuity artifacts when switching from the voxel to the point representation? Um, so if you use the, uh, the blending, then discontinuity, it's barely visible, can happen, but barely visible. The bigger problem is also not the color discontinuity, the, the, the geometric discontinuity, because we don't really know how, far, uh, how large these points should be. They don't have a size, so what can happen is that you might uh, see some popping artifacts uh, as additional level of detail is um, added and rendered. But yeah, that's a problem that's kind of difficult to solve uh, without doing some really um, processing of the neighborhood, create surface maybe or something like that. Any other questions? Then maybe one from me. Um, you said you add 50,000 points to your leaf nodes. Why exactly 50,000? Uh, it's kind of a magic number. It worked out nicely that way. Okay. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons is because this voxel grid, the size, 128, um, it produces, on average, about 20 to 30,000 voxels per um, node. And uh, if we have a maximum size of 50,000 points per leaf node, then the averages also ends up about being the same. So it's just that the leaf nodes have the same average size as the inner nodes. Okay, thanks. So are there any more questions? Otherwise, I would like to thank Markus for this great talk.
So the next paper will be about um, making tetrahedral meshes more coarser. I think we need a bit more time. So Tess, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, then I think we should start. Let's give it up for Daniel Ströter um, with massively parallel adaptive collapsing of edges for unstructured tetrahedral meshes. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Daniel Ströter from the Technical University of Darmstadt. Today I will present an algorithm about massively parallel edge collapsing in an unstructured tetrahedral mesh. In the title graphics, you can see from left to right the coarsening of a fine robot mesh. From left to right, more and more edges are collapsed so that um, the model is getting coarser and coarser. Um, but before I go into detail, um, I want to present the uh, um, state of the, uh, the, the background on um, edge collapse operations. Um, an edge collapse operation replaces one edge with a new vertex. An edge co collapse operation also um, removes the simplices um, that, are, uh, that contain the edge um, in the, um, oh, sorry. Um, uh, so, so, that, no, not the, uh, okay. so in, in the image, uh, you, you can see the two triangles um, containing the edge are removed. Um, and progressively collapsing edges um, in a mesh uh, significantly reduces the vertex count and the element count. Um, another important aspect of edge collapse operations is uh, that you cannot always collapse an edge. Um, so you need to prevent uh, inverted elements um, because they can lead to false results in rendering applications or for numerical methods. And you also um, need to um, ensure that every edge collapse operation satisfies the link condition in order to uh, preserve the topological type of the mesh. Um, furthermore, you need to uh, preserve the boundary uh, in some way uh, so that you do not distort the model. Um, I know one, uh, why you might um, know um, why um, you collapse edges in uh, a surface mesh, uh, for instance, to um, generate some level of detail. You might be asking why um, should somebody collapse edges in an unstructured tetrahedral mesh. Um, and I want to show three example applications on why um, edge collapse operations in unstructured tetrahedral meshes are important. Um, one is mesh adaptation. For instance, in um, the figure to the right, you can see a part mesh where the top part is meshed unnecessarily fine. And um, the um, mesh around the ho whole part is um, too coarse for an accurate uh, simulation. So mesh adaptation refines the mesh um, in the area of the whole part and coarsens uh, the top part in order to reduce the um, load on the, uh, on the computational load on the numerical method. Um, another important um, application is mesh optimization. Uh, you can see, for instance, in the um, figure um, at the bottom right uh, that uh, thin triangles can be removed uh, using one uh, collapse operation. And also important is uh, our visualization tasks. Um, you can see at the bottom two uh, uh, figures, um, one, um, uh, each of these figures has been uh, generated using direct volume rendering. In direct volume rendering, you render a scalar field where each vertex uh, is associated with a scalar value. And um, on the uh, right, uh, you see uh, the direct volume rendering of a fine mesh with over one million tetrahedra, but you can reduce the size of the mesh to one quarter and um, achieve um, roughly the same image. But I will get back to that in a couple of minutes. For now, I want to highlight a related work. Um, and reflecting on the state of the art um, in uh, parallel remeshing, most work addresses surface meshes, and that's especially the case for uh, the GPU domain. And um, most remeshing uh, frameworks use uh, domain decomposition and uh, CPU parallelism. 
And um, I want to highlight two recent methods. Um, one is the uh, GPU parallel method of uh, Gautron et al. introduced for surface meshes. Uh, they use uh, the uh, atomic, they use 64 atomic min, 64 bit atomic min operations to distribute an edge descriptor among the cavity of an edge. Um, the um, the uh, edge descriptor encodes the coast and the index of an edge, and if um, after distribution in the cavity of the edge, uh, the um, edge descriptor is unique, um, then this edge can be collapsed free of conflict. And another important um, method is uh, the framework of Young et al. using Intel's TBB and mutex blocking, uh, mutex locking, sorry, and uh, this mutex locking mechanism can be a uh, expensive because um, they lock vertices in the Turing neighborhood of edges, meaning that edges cannot be closer together as um, depicted in the figure below. So I thought um, in order to make a significant contribution, um, I uh, should ex address massively parallel edge collapsing for unstructured tetrahedral meshes. And um, in my research, I devised a very interesting algorithm that I want to share with you today. The algorithm design is as, is as generic as possible. Um, edges are marked for collapsing um, in order to keep the procedure adaptive, and marked edges um, are uh, potentially collapsed. Um, I have a placement strategy to um, specify the behavior or to specify how vertices are positioned that, are, that replace the edge. Then I also have a cost function to specify how um, edges are prioritized during collapsing, um, a termination threshold, epsilon c. Um, and um, uh, and uh, there's a termination threshold epsilon c, um, which um, holds the number of minimal uh, edge collapse operations in an iteration. If in an iteration no more than epsilon c uh, edges can be found for collapsing, then the, the algorithm terminates. And we use the uh, TCS R mesh uh, data structure uh, to calculate um, mesh connectivity relationships on the GPU, and you can calculate from every simplex to any sub-simplex, top-down to bottom-up the um, element connectivity relationships. Um, now I will show how the procedure works um, on a simple example. And the first step is to filter out those edges that are not admissible for uh, collapsing. And um, this is done in a parallel pass over edges. Um, and uh, it just basically evaluates the predicate Q and Q, just summarizes um, inverted elements uh, and, and constraints such as the link condition. And also, um, I preserve the boundary and, and um, I only collapse edges along uh, geometrical faces and ridges of the model in order to um, uh, meet the demands of engineering applications. Um, so in the figure, um, the red edges are marked for collapsing and the red numbers represent um, the cost values of these edges. Um, now, we first uh, take a look at the admissibility, and obviously, uh, two edges violate the link condition, so they're unmarked uh, for collapsing. Now, it remains to resolve conflicts um, in order to collapse edges in parallel, and this is done in two passes. The first one um, works in parallel over edges, and um, this works um, by uh, using um, the one ring of adjacent edges for every vertex. Every edge has two vertices, and we can use um, the one rings of adjacent vertices to each of the edge vert vertices um, to, um, to check the edges adjacent to um, an edge um, associated with a thread. And um, one in, in the figure, we have one pair of adjacent edges, and the one with the larger cost value is unmarked. Um, then we also allocate an array word affected by edge, um, which is of the size of the number of vertices. Uh, so each vertex is now tagged with a number, and if um, an edge survives this first um, conflict detection stage, then we tag the vertex with the um, index, with the edge index uh, that is uh, to be collapsed, um, and we use that information. Oh, the, the edge indices uh, are, are uh, the, the black numbers, and they are written to, uh, to, to, to the vertices. Um, and, and now we use that recorded information to finally resolve conflicts, because obviously um, two conflicts um, 
still are present in, in um, the mesh. Um, so this is done in a parallel pass over simplices. And, um, and um, so for, for each simplex, um, we take a look at the vertices. If there are um, more than two edges um, associated with the simplex, and um, if that is the case, um, we compare uh, the edge codes of these, um, the, the collapse codes of these edges, and, um, and uh, we unmark the edges with a larger coast value. So um, in the figure, the white triangles uh, do not take any effect on the mesh, uh, on the marking, but the blue triangles, they unmark uh, the larger, um, they unmark the edges with the larger coast values so that um, we achieve a compact set of conflict-free edges and that can be collapsed simultaneously. And um, in every collapsing iteration, we recalculate the cost values um, of, um, of the edges, and we rebuild the um, element connectivity relationships um, using the TCSR mesh data structure. And I will now present some evaluation results about, um, and, and of course, the, the most um, important thing is that your method actually works and is uh, correct. Uh, while you can mathematically prove uh, the algorithm, it is always good to check the implementation. So I checked the, the robustness and correctness of the implementation um, using um, all the 10K TED meshes um, generated by Hu et al. for their publication, Task Cesarehedral Meshing in the Wild. And um, fortunately, everything went well and uh, no inversions occurred and all the resulting um, meshes were valid. Um, and um, so, uh, and, and um, I also evaluated the runtimes on these um, methods. Um, and on average, um, I can coerce um, these meshes uh, to uh, in, in uh, 180 milliseconds to the median edge length of an input mesh. And this is uh, quite fast already. But um, in order uh, to evaluate runtimes, I use larger meshes having uh, millions of elements. And, uh, but before I get to the runtime evaluation, I present some uh, kind of systematic um, evaluation um, or comparison with uh, the method of Gautron et al. Um, again, we have an initial setup with three marked edges. Um, of course, 1.0, 1 1.1, and 1.2. And using the method of Gautron et al., the 1.1 edge um, propagates its coast into the cavity of the 1.2 edge. Um, so um, only one edge is, remains to be collapsed, um, while uh, when we use our method, um, we benefit from the intermediate step uh, checking the adjacent edges, and we find two collapses. So this is just a systematic comparison to visualize that we find more collapses. And we, if we now plot this um, for the um, atlas crank meshes having roughly six, six million um, elements, um, the, um, and, and the, the, the x, um, the x uh, axis um, encodes the iterations, and the y axis the total number of um, uh, collapse operations. Um, our method is in red, and the method of Gautron et al. is in dashed magenta. And as you can see, our method converges more than twice as fast than the method of uh, Gautron et al. So this is a, a significant benefit. It's still not as, uh, it still does not converge as fast as CPU sequential collapsing in blue, but we are getting quite close to it. And that's, that's uh, quite good for, for massively parallel method. Um, I now present some runtime evaluation. Um, the um, x-axis now shows different um, edge length thresholds. The y-axis is scaled logarithmically and shows the runtimes. Um, and we find a significant speed up. Again, uh, our method is in red. Uh, sequential collapsing in blue. CPU parallel collapsing um, using Young et al's framework is in black. And, um, and uh, dash magenta is again Gautron's method. And, we um, are up to 2.7 times faster than Gautron et al's method, up to 7.4 um, times faster than Young et al using CPU parallel uh, execution, and um, up to 34 times faster than uh, sequential collapsing. And when it comes to runtime evaluation, um, one of the key questions is what are the main overheads? And um, for our method, uh, the main overhead is um, 
the um, uh, recalculation of um, element connectivity relationships. Um, you can see in the plot um, our method with collapsing only um, with, with, without the recalculation of element connectivity relationships, considering only collapsing, um, there's quite a jump between our method in brown and um, our method in red. So there's, um, uh, there's a huge potential for, um, for uh, improvement still. And you, um, if, um, if some um, data structure for dynamic um, recalculation of element connectivity is available, then um, runtimes can be um, even faster. Um, and um, all of these um, methods um, have in common that uh, all of these collapsing methods have in common that they um, um, do the, the bulk of the collapse or perform the bulk of the collapse operations um, in the initial iteration. So it's interesting uh, to evaluate the trade-offs of um, skipping um, a bunch of collapse operations for the sake of faster runtimes and. If we set epsilon c to 1,000, uh, meaning that um, at least 1,000 iterations um, have to be collapse operations have to be found in an iteration um, to proceed convert to proceed as uh, a method, then um, we find that um, we can coarsen the um, robot mesh to almost um, half of the simplices in only 700 milliseconds, and um, setting epsilon c to 700, we can significantly the mesh below one second for full conversions. Um, the, we, we do not have that much of an effect, but the runtime is, um, but but we have quite twice the run, more than twice the runtime. Um, so that's also um, pretty interesting that um, the the, re, the last iterations um, uh, do not uh, that much um, do not take that much an effect of and on the mesh. Um, and now I want to show that our method can be applied uh, to um, uh, two important methods. Um, one, as I've already said, is uh, direct volume rendering. Uh, direct volume rendering, um, as I've said, um, is the rendering of a scalar field. And um, each um, vertex is annotated with a scalar value. And um, so the cost function is oriented to these, uh, uh, scale, to, to these scalar values. Um, so. Um, so the two edge vertices, um, we, we take a look at the two edge vertices at the scalar values and um, evaluate the, um, the difference between the scalar values and um, that's basically the cost function. Um, and of course you need to protect edges with, high dip, with, with a large difference in scalar values. Um, and um, collapsing these, um, these uh, coll coarsening the mesh using um, our collapsing operation, we can um, uh, for this fusion mesh, almost half the size of, of the mesh, um, while um, do, do not incur that much loss of rendering quality. And this is very in interesting because this not only um, reduces the memory demand due to the mesh, but also due to the um, um, spatial data structure and also significantly accelerates a spatial data structure construction because the spatial data structure construction uh, considers fewer elements. Um, Another important use case, as I've already mentioned, is um, mesh optimization. Um, and um, I also present an example for mesh optimization where I use um, harmonic triangulations introduced by Mark Alexa. Um, and harmonic triangulations are basically um, an alternative to sliver exudation, um, removing ill-shaped elements. And um, ill-shaped elements are rendered in red. And as you can see, um, we can um, remove most of um, the ill-shaped elements um, uh, using a, a procedure of collapsing, where collapsing uses as a cost function a mesh quality improvement and element flipping and GPU parallel vertex relocation. Um, placement strategy is, is now a line search um, in order to optimize element quality. Um, and this is also quite um, interesting because you can do this in only 300 milliseconds and um, mesh optimization is always a predominant overhead in, in um, mesh generation procedures. So um, in conclusion, we have introduced um, a massively parallel conflict detection method to find com um, compact sets of conflict-free edges for remeshing. Um, we have also shown that GPUs can be um, use, uh, that the usage of GPUs is beneficial for um, coarsening um, uh, unstructured heterohedral meshes and 
uh, in future work, um, it is very interesting um, to uh, use our conflict detection for other remeshing problems um, and also to evaluate different, uh, uh, different types of meshes, um, such as triangle meshes. And we really uh, hope to motivate future work, so um, we have published the source code. Um, thanks for your attention, um, and I'm now ready for a Q&A round. So, thanks a lot for this talk. Um, are there any questions? Okay, then I will ask you. Uh, okay, then let me ask one. Yes. Um, do, have you thought about, like, um, right now I think you haven't considered that all of these pterohedral, uh, pterohedrons have the same volume or equally mm. sized volume. But do you think there is any benefit in, in also um, making sure that the volume is uniformly in, in terms of? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, for, for direct volume rendering, for instance, because when, when you have uh, in, in direct volume rendering, when you have uh, different element sizes, then the, data, then the spatial data structure needs to cope with that. And um, then you have higher branching in, in, uh, during rendering. And if you um, can uh, make it more uniform, then uh, I think you can accelerate uh, the rendering, yes. Mm -hmm. I guess for finite element methods, this could also be mm -hmm. useful. Yeah. OK. Are there now questions? OK, then let me ask another one. You showed for volume rendering that um, it reduces the memory and also the build time for the acceleration structures, but how does it uh, affect the rendering performance? Ah, that's, that's an interesting question, and um, the answer, it, it, it depends. Um, one, um, one, one reason that it can, or, or one, um, one, one thing you can do is, as you said, uh, to, to um, make the distribution more uniform, make the sizing more uniform, and that can be beneficial for the rendering performance. But um, the thing is, in in, ren in direct volume rendering, you sample um, the uh, you, you sample the, the geometry, and um, the the sampling rate is um, more affected by uh, the shape of the geometry and not by the inner structure. So you do not have uh, usually you do not have that, or um, uh, or you do not have an inherent benefit uh, co coarsening the mesh. It's more for for memory um, efficiency. Okay. So I guess it's not just uniformity, but also not having a um, lot of long triangles inside of mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Okay, do we have a question here? I have a question about performance. You, um, so does it include uh, this uh, conflict detection or just uh, the remove operation? Yes, the uh, performance evaluation uh, includes the conflict detection, yes. And how much, how, how big is the part of conflict detection in the whole? Uh, conflict detection, that, that's, that's not a big part. Most of it, um, most of the overall performance is um, to recalculate the element connectivity relationship, classify boundary, um, and, um, and yeah, to, to some extent, to, to, to a minor extent, the admissibility checks, but the conflict detection is very fast. It's only a, a, a few milliseconds per iteration. Okay, any more questions? Then I would like to thank you. And, <laughs> and the next speaker, please come. So the next paper is about mesh segmentation by uh, projecting the vertices on a sphere and using that transformation to make it easier to calculate distances. So I would... Um,
I'd like to introduce Xiao Peng, who will present, present now spherical parametric measurement for continuous and balanced mesh segmentation. Some applause, please. All right. Hi, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present this work at HPG and also to the broader audience from the EGSR. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity. This is my first time to be this wonderful campus. It's very nice to travel seven hours from the US to the Europe. Uh, and also I want to make clear that this the main contribution from this uh, in this work is from my students. Uh, so uh, they are PhD students, uh, but because of the time, not enough to get the visa. So I'm their representative <laughs> in here. So I will try my best to make the work clear. Uh, and hopefully you will like it. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, in this work, we present a parallel algorithm for segmenting the mesh into a balanced mesh structure. Um, so by saying balanced, uh, we actually mean the submeshes, as you can see in the figure, is going to contain an equal number of triangles. Uh, this structure has potential to improve the utilization of parallel computing architecture in you know, many geometry uh, processing applications, such level detail, many people already talk about that, uh, and also maybe uh, mesh compression. We're going to show some you know, testing we have done with these two applications at the end of the, this slide. Um, so uh, let me use a GPU example uh, to illustrate our motivation why we do this type of segmentation. Uh, so GPU design, as we know, this with array of streaming multiprocessors uh, and that manage blocks of threads uh, with uh, accessing to the same shared memory. Uh, so when we have a mesh, uh, the vertices and triangles is uh, going to be organized as arrays, like buffer objects. Yeah, and then uh, they would have to send over from the CPU to the GPU and maintain it in the global memory. Uh, and uh, then, uh, as we know, they have to maintain there and uh, then the thread is going to access them actually from the uh, global memory. Uh, so what we are thinking about, uh, some new mesh structure is going to be like partition the mesh in this way so that we can organize this uh, complex mesh into sub meshes and they have equal size. And uh, when they maintain in the GPU memory, uh, so we have uh, exact control about their size, and uh, this could be better matching into the hardware requirement uh, so that we can better utilize the GPU memory to do certain applications. Maybe not all the application, but for the certain application which can benefit from the uh, you know, balanced segmentation could be utilized to share, share memory uh, in, in a better way. Um, so the challenge here is basically has been recognized in the literature. So basically exactly balancing uh, the sub meshes is an NP problem. So we can do this in the CPU, uh, but it will be time consuming. Uh, so we are trying to address this issue by uh, proposing some primary goals. The first goal is basically we want to come up with a strategy so that we can precisely control the triangle counts among the sub meshes. And uh, the second goal would be after they segmented, we want to maintain their two manifold topology in each sub mesh. So this is kind of critical, we think, uh, because uh, uh, if we don't do that, so we may end up with some result like this type of segmentation. So you can see right here some uh, triangles, they are continuous, continuously connected, uh, but they are not through the edges, they are through the points. So this is known as a bauta issue. It's non manifold issue. So if you do the level of detail, like simplification, those triangles would be considered as uh, boundary triangles. They cannot be further simplified. So we want to minimize this type of issue if we want to really have a nice uh, mesh patch. Uh, so this is the second goal we want to achieve. And also, of course, um, you know, uh, on the GPU architecture, uh, Different GPU have different configuration. So if we have different hardware, we may want to uh, redo the segmentation so the algorithm should be fast enough to help people to you know, reconfigure into different number of sub meshes. 
Uh, so uh, we looked into the literature. We found some people already done the similar work. Uh, so one of the uh, common approaches to use the uh, region grow approach. Uh, so this also has been represented in the uh, talk paper called Arc Smash. Uh, and there are also recent talk paper already uh, discusses as well. So basically, they can, you can specify K seed triangles uh, that allow you to customize the number of sub meshes, and then you just grow them into a continuous patch. So the good thing is that they can maintain the continuity. Uh, so there is a guarantee that connect, uh, you know, uh, uh, connected through the edges. Uh, but there is lack of support for balancing. So basically, there is no guarantee the triangle count is going to be balanced. Um, so another one could be a little bit old, but it's the state of art, so, which is called Matisse. If you do the geometry processing, probably this is a wide-known library has been used by many uh, researchers. Uh, so this maintains the continue in these conditions. So basically, they do have the Bauta issue. The code is continuously connected, but it's through the, vert through the vertices. Um, and they do support uh, balancing because they do the bisectional partition. Uh, hierarchically doing this is pretty fast, uh, but it's not exactly balanced. Uh, we'll show you uh, some of the uh, results uh, that we have tested later. Uh, and there is another one called Jabija. I hope I pronounce this right. Uh, so that basically supports the exact balancing, which is exactly balanced the number of triangles. However, there will be some serious issue in continuity. So it's not continuously connected patch. Uh, so this comes up with the overall overview of our approach. Uh, we're using a different domain, not in the 3D domain. We're using the spherical domain. So I'll show you why we want to use it. There is a performance consideration that could be accelerated if we do the measurement in this domain. Uh, so first of all, we had to do the spherical parameterization, basically uh, convert a 3D mesh uh, into a spherical representation. And then we randomly initialize the labels. So label is means the sub mesh label. So we don't care which label is assigned to which triangle. We just do uh, the random initialization. So it would be appear like this: very colorful, random colors. Uh, so we propose a new algorithm called the cohesion algorithm uh, that start with this chaos, and we're going to grouping the triangle. Uh, excuse me, into the sub meshes. Uh, so basically, at the core of the execution, it would be uh, parallelize the label swapping operations. So basically, if we have different, like two triangles as a pair, we're going to uh, examine do we need to swap them in order to let the nearby triangle to be coherent. Uh, so after that, uh, it will be something like this. Uh, it's still in the spherical domain. Uh, and there will be some issues, as you can see, there are little triangles, blue triangles. It does have a bauta issue, so this algorithm is not perfect. It cannot resolve the, the things we want to resolve. So we have another algorithm called the refinement that's going to improve uh, the smoothness of the boundary. Uh, less boundary edge would be better uh, for a geometry processing. Uh, and also, we try to remove such uh, a bauta issue. And eventually, we're going to convert this domain into the 3D domain, so we get the mesh segmented. Um, so this is general idea we have. So the critical things is go basically the label swapping. So we start with the randomization uh, assigning the uh, labels. Uh, and I'm going to use an example to illustrate how we do the swapping. Uh, so let's say we have uh, uh, two sub meshing here at an uh, intermediate uh, step. And then uh, we do have a uh, pick one pair of triangle. Uh, and we're going to decide, do we need to swap these two labels? Uh, obviously, you can directly figure out we should, right? So, so basically, uh, we do some measurement. The first thing is going to uh, calculate the, the centroid position of the sub mesh. So the blue sun mesh, the centroid position is here. The yellow patch, the centroid mesh, uh, centroid position is here. And then we also do the same thing uh, for the pair of the triangles, finding their centroid position. And uh, uh, we 
compute the distance between uh, the submesh and the triangle which is belong to the same submesh, uh, and we are going to uh, record their distance. Uh, and we're going to assume that uh, the triangle has been swapped with the labels. So their label already swapped. Uh, and we do the same measurement on the distance. So basically, we got the D3 and D4 in this, uh, you know, uh, labels in here. Uh, we sum them together. So as you can see, this is before swapping, this is after swapping. And we can just measure if the distance becomes smaller, so they are going to be better coherent into a, uh, you know, nearby group. So this is uh, our uh, uh, strategy in here. Uh, so in this case, uh, it does need to be swapped in order to have a better uh, result. Uh, so the critical part in here is would be how should we choose the distance measurement. So one of the uh, common use approach would be you know uh, geodesic distance. Uh, so this has been used and presented in many papers, right? So it's basically defined the minimum paths connecting two triangles. In case in our case, it would be triangles. So it's very precise. It's computed in surface domain, doesn't need a sphere, uh, and but this is expensive, okay? Because you have to go through the topological connection, and it's hard to do the computation in parallel. Uh, in our case, uh, this uh, geodesic distance is actually represents uh, the minimum number of edges on the dual graph or triangle. So in this example, this could be something like this. Um, so as I just mentioned, also uh, you know, evaluated in the uh, uh, literature, uh, people have found this is definitely computational uh, costly. Um, so we found an uh, alternative solution. So uh, we parameterize things onto the sphere, and we can use a core distance as an estimation to measure such distance. It's not precise. It's not going to be accurate, but it's fast. It's a measure distance at constant time. Uh, so and also it can preserve the correctness of comparison. So as you can see in the algorithm, uh, distance doesn't have to be accurate, but the comparison has to be correct. So we care about the correct of the comparison. So we choose this faster computation approach. Uh, but you know, as you know, we do require this thing had to be in the spherical parameterization. Uh, so, so that's uh, basically what we do uh, for the uh, label swapping, and we have done this uh, in parallel. Uh, so, in terms of implementation, uh, we evaluate the unique pairs of triangles in, in parallel. So by meaning the unique pairs, we ensure that each triangle is part of its only one other triangle. So this is to avoid the resting conditions on the GPU. Uh, you know, if multiple triangles attempt to swap labels simultaneously, so we would have some resting conditions. Uh, so specifically, we're going to assign the first uh, uh, index part of with the last one the second with the second last, and so on until the middle two are paired. So we kind of, you know, bend the array into like two two rows, so we can see the uh, the pairing uh, in a better way. Uh, so so this is only like one cycle of the repeat. So basically, we apply a round robin scheduling method. To update the triangle indices, uh, indices in the uh, in the pairs, so we're going to start from the second element, so from here, and uh, we're going to shift the index value forward by one. So basically, for example, this ui going to be equal to ui minus one, and the first one going to be replaced with the last index. Uh, so this is going to be repeated n minus one times uh, uh, to shift uh, uh, the indices and ensure all the triangles pairs are going to be evaluated. So this n minus one time, going, we call it one iteration. So one iteration is now enough to make sure 
out some meshes is into uh, into their their correct place. So we're going to iterate uh, many times until there are no triangle pair need to swap. Uh, so they're basically iterative uh, approach, but each each iteration going to be a parallel implementation. Uh, so here is a, a video clip uh, where we are showing uh, uh, this coherent, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, coherent process. So initialization is uh, is very uh, random, uh, and uh, we also uh, recorded the number of boundary edges during the coherent process, and also the ball ties uh, during the process. So the first few steps is cohere them very fast. So basically, uh, just one or two iterations, you can see they are into some rough uh, shape. Uh, and then we have uh, a few iterations is, uh, during the process, they try to reduce the number of boundary edges and also try to reduce the number of bow, bow tie. So we do have a total of iteration, uh, the number of iteration is 25. So that's kind of uh, stabilized after that. So you can see we do have, still have the issue, and this this is reduced a lot, but still like almost a thousand uh, boundary edges. Uh, okay, so after that, uh, we have the refinement step. Uh, the goal is trying to uh, uh, resolve the bow tie issue and the smoothing the uh, boundaries. As you can see, uh, this one uh, we do have some issue here and uh, some issue. Uh, here, right? So we're trying to resolve them. Um, so uh, for the refinement, the evaluation of the pair triangles are quite similar to the coherent process. Uh, the difference is that we are not really measure the distance. We do uh, a measure uh, based on the topological connection uh, in the neighbor triangles. Uh, the first of all, we want to count the number of boundary edges in the pair of triangle. So let's say uh, we still do the uh, you know, triangle pairing like this too. Uh, and then uh, for this a triangle pair, we count the number of boundary edges. Uh, for the yellow one, uh, it has two boundary edge adjacent to the blue sub mesh. And so this is between to the yellow, but it's adjacent to the blue with two boundary edge. And this one, the same thing, and the way uh, going to record them. And we also look into the neighbor. Uh, so basically, uh, the neighbor is defined as the triangle that have labeled the same sub mesh uh, uh, as, the, as this triangle. So this will be the yellow one with also its neighbor with two boundary, and this neighbor with the one boundary. Uh, so, and we do the similar approach that we assume they have been swapped. We do the same counting for the boundary edges for the triangle pair and the neighbor triangle. Uh, and then we come up with a, a sum squares uh, 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 method uh, as a cost value uh, for this evaluation. Uh, so, and to compare before the swapping and after swapping. Uh, so uh, if this is cost value becomes smaller of the swapping, we uh, indeed uh, proceed with this swap. Uh, so here's a, a video clip showing uh, the result. Uh, refinements kind of uh, spend much less number of iterations. It only takes three, uh, and still we have some boundary edges, uh, and the way uh, we do remove the bow tie uh, issue in here. Uh, so as you can see, in our approach, the most important part is the input match had to be spherical parameterization uh, because we want to take advantage for the distance measurement. So we don't have contribution in spherical parameterization. We're just taking our existing work. Actually, my team have done this research in different, uh, at a different venue. Uh, so we just use that uh, parameterization approach uh, to uh, create the sphere. Uh, basically, we do the mesh simplification that simplify the high curvature region and embed that high curvature region into the flattened area. So eventually, we get the tetrahedral. Uh, so this is like a feature embedding process. And after that, we're going to insert the vertices back uh, into uh, the 3D space 
at the same time going to project this triangle uh, into the sphere. Uh, that would be in the reverse order of the collapsing. So as you can see, uh, this is inserted and pro projected onto the sphere. It's into the local wiring domain. So as uh, indicated in this uh, popping purple thing, yeah, you may <laughs> be able to catch that. So that's basically uh, the local space, the local region that the vertex insert into on the sphere. Uh, so here is our result. Uh, we tested with twenty one uh, models. Uh, the largest one we have about half a million triangles. The smallest one only have a few thousand triangles in there. Uh, the limitation is actually how complex the model we can do is basically limited by uh, the robustness of the spherical parameterization. We do try to have larger model can be parameterized, but it looks like we have some engineering issues that we get into the floating point errors. So eventually when you insert the vertices, it's space is getting small and small. So it's really hard to do actually. So this is one of the future work I think we definitely want to look into. Either finding a distance measurement in surface domain and the fast, or we improve the robustness of spherical parameterization and using this kind of core, core distance. Uh, so that will be some future work. And we uh, conduct a comparison between our approach uh, with region grow and the Matisse. Uh, so this is our approach. So middle wise region grow, this is Matisse. Uh, so uh, here, MTCD is stand for the max triangle count difference between any two uh, sub meshes. So as you can see, we have a well balanced number of triangles. You see, there is a most of one 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 is because uh, the total number of triangles cannot be evenly divided by the uh, number of sub meshes. So but it would be either zero or one. Uh, and uh, Matisse did a good job too in terms of balancing, uh, but region grow is is not uh, that good. It's it's quite have some large uh, imbalancing issue. Um, so uh, also we look into the non manifold issue, which we call it power bolt high. So we re completely remove them, uh, and region grow also can remove them, right? So and but uh, Matisse is not really. Uh, uh, able to guarantee that, okay? Uh, so this one, this column is basically the number of boundary edges. So we uh, check on that. Uh, as you can see, uh, our result is similar to uh, the result of Matisse. So the sum mesh shape is roughly good. Uh, yeah, I think we run out of time. Uh, so there are some other results uh, we kind of evaluated. So there is a non-manifold issue in Matisse, and we compared this and enlarged what the issue are. Uh, and we also did some timing result, for example, uh, coherence time. So through the iteration, we're using the human model with 200 sub meshes. As you can see, this execution time. The first few iteration is, is did most of the job, uh, but it's time consuming. How the multi triangle had to be swapped labels. Uh, and the number of edges is reduced in the first few iterations and then stabilized in the rest. So technically, uh, refinement is more costly in terms of the execution time. So because we look into the neighbors, right? So that will be uh, much higher than coherence step, but the iteration number is much less. Uh, so we have two testing implications, as I mentioned, one is the level detail on the GPU. We didn't do the uh, uh, you know, view dependent level detail, we just do the uh, sum mesh uh, level detail. Uh, so each one is kind of fit into the shared memory, so there is the shared memory usage, as you can see, we are quite high. Uh, and also, uh, there is a ratio of non-collapsibility, so where ours are lower means the boundary edge is minimized. Uh, so. So we also did a mesh compression test. Uh, uh, we used uh, the Google uh, Draco Mesh Compression Library to encode the meshes, and we're testing the decoding time. So this is on the CPU using multi-threading approach, so not on the GPU. So this is, our uh, approach is able to balance the workload. If you do the CPU, that's a good advantage as well. So as you can see, when the number of triangles is large, so our stuff is more significant. 
uh, better than others. Uh, for the small meshes, it's not, the difference is not significant. Uh, so in conclusion, we do present two algorithms in spherical domain, and the limitation obviously is restricted to genius zero mesh, uh, because they need to be sphere. And possibly we could have a failing case uh, because of the local optimal uh, during the refinement. Uh, and in the future, we are thinking about maybe we can introduce and handle the seams and open boundaries in order to reduce the genius level. So genius two will be one cut, right? Genius one. Or genius two will be two cut, genius one will be one cut. Uh, and also, we definitely want to further uh, investigate the uh, refinement algorithm and improve the spherical parameterization robustness. So also, we can use this to build the building, uh, to build the hierarchical mesh structure. So that could be uh, some promising direction we want to go. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Um, we are quite out of time, but for two questions, maybe we have some time. Yeah. Uh, where's the sphere? Yeah, please. Okay. 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 Hey, thank Hi. you. Hi. Thank you for the talk. I have a question with you using um, the spherical projection. Does mm -hmm. your method also work for meshes non homeomorphic to spheres, so with torus or other types of topologies? The, the torus, like the donor Does it work shape? with the torus? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but, could you, but could you map it? Do, could you do your distance measurement on the torus? Yes, we can. But the, the criteria would be a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? So the sphere is easy to the core distance. The, the torus or the donor shape could be some other mathematical uh, equation, but still will be constant time. Yeah. The, one other question was a, a fascinating talk. The, the method you have to actually map it to the sphere, have you considered using that to, say, do uh, texture atlas generation? So what did I mean? Texture atlas generation, mapping bits of the, the texture into a, into a map. Oh, texture map. Oh, yeah. So that they all get roughly the same amount of area and stuff. It just yeah, seems that's like it could be, be Yeah, that would be uh, quite different directions. Yeah, we should, we should think about that. Um, uh, or... Our motivation is come from the GPU, and what we want to do is kind of like leverage what we have done on the spherical parameterization. <laughs> so, and we kind of find a quick and a matching and approach to do that. Yeah, but definitely I can look into that in the future. Maybe a quick question from myself. And when you go back to the slide where you showed the sphere on the right side and the mesh on the left side, um, I noticed that on the sphere, the segments are very compact, but on the mesh, they are um, pulled quite. Some, uh, uh, sometimes this they're one pulled, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. They are pulled a bit and are not as compact maybe as on the sphere. But this could be problematic maybe for a mesh led carling or something like this. Have you considered like keeping the compactness of the of the segments also on the mesh? Because right now it's only in the sphere more. Oh, oh, the packnets. Uh, yeah. yeah, that could be a future work. Uh, we didn't really com consider the packnets are preserving the semantic meaning for parts mm -hmm. uh, during the segmentation. So, uh, algorithm, the result could be different because the initialization is a uh, is a random labeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, our g g two major goals is one is trying to make sure they continuously connected. Second one is to make sure the triangle counts are equally balanced. Uh, so in terms of uh, compaction, path preservation, yeah, it's not really considered. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Thanks. But, yeah, thank you for the question. So I would like thank, to thank all of the speakers today. <laughs> really great talk. <laughs> yeah, and I will give it further to Mike. Thank you, Lucas. Oh. Um, all right. The HPG people, uh, we have prepared uh, the, uh, the ballots, so they are here in the front of the room. You can pick one up, and then you will find that there are stickers that you can use to indicate your preference. So please put three stickers on each ballot, on, on one ballot. Uh, <laughs> put three stickers on one ballot that indicates your, uh, your favorite papers. Um, this, is, this is only for the HPG people, so please don't vote if you are here for EGRSR. Um, and uh, it would be lovely if you could use the first five minutes of your coffee break for that, so that we have some time to actually count the votes. So thank you very much, and enjoy your break.
just received permission from the paper's chairs for us to mark the uh, ballots with pencil or pen uh, because distributing the stickers seems to take some time. So stickers or pencil or pen. De nieuwe Opel Astra Sports Tour Plug-in Hybrid spreekt voor zich. Level up. Ontvang nu een gratis upgrade en stap zonder meer prijs in een nog exclusievere uitvoering. When it comes to video creation, every detail matters. I go to artlist.io for music that matches my vision. The more options I have, the bigger my story becomes. With advanced filter options, I can find what I need in a snap. Each track is made by artists as passionate as I am. High-end sound effects add a whole new dimension to make my videos perfect. And I get all this in a license that covers all my creative needs. I tell my story with Artlist.
Kan schakelen, kan versnellen. Ontdek hoe Vodafone Business uw bedrijf vooruit helpt met oplossingen voor veilig hybride werken. Leer meer op vodafone.nl/slash business. Together we can. Vodafone. Vroeger waren alle boeren biologisch. Tot alles ineens intensiever moest met meer en meer en meer. En de stallen mega werden. Nu doen wij het samen met 2500 biologische boeren echt anders. En we zijn pas net begonnen. Triodos Bank.
Let me actually. This is the. Uh, this one. Scherm je mooiste bezit met onze autoverzekering. Interpolis. Glashelder.
Hello? Test? Test?
impuls. Een elektrische kracht die je drijft om te doen wat je voelt. Je wordt geleerd impulsen te beheersen. Maar niets brengt je verder dan de impuls die je voelt van binnen. The impulse of a new generation. Cupra Born. 100% elektrisch. Welcome back, everybody. We'll start the session shortly, so please take a seat. Okay, so hello everybody for the third and last day of HPG and also welcome to the EGSR attendees. HPG is made possible by the support of our sponsors and one of the highest tier sponsors is uh, Reality Labs Research. And now we'll hear a bit from Brian Batch about what work they are doing there and I'm very much looking forward to that. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so in the pursuit of AR, like real high quality AR glasses, um, we are doing a lot of work in novel optics, novel displays, and as a consequence, we need to do graphics work to also drive those displays. Uh, we're also really interested in doing non-traditional graphics pipelines. Um, we have a budget of about 100 milliwatts on a device like that, which is two orders of magnitude less than you have on most mobile devices today. Uh, and so we don't think that traditional architectures scale down uh, appropriately for that. Um, we're doing content creation. We're doing 2D and 3D asset compression of all different kinds. Uh, our groups are doing. Uh, novel neural and codec avatars. We're also doing more traditional avatar work and uh, looking into shading of human skin and hair, simulation and rendering of cloth, and character animation and more. Uh, we're publishing. This is the work that I was able to gather from our labs so far this year. So you can see we have uh, quite a variety of, of different papers being published. And I wanted to uh, let folks know that if, if any interns are looking for, uh, for a role for next year, uh, we start um, looking at interns kind of October time frame. So we'd be, we'd be really excited to work with you guys. I have an intern here that, that worked with me last year, and it was a, a great experience. Um, we also uh, sometimes do sponsorships and, uh, and sponsor university labs. We sometimes also hire visiting professors. Uh, if you're interested in any of these opportunities, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, this is my email. 
And we even have maybe a small limited amount of hiring happening. Um, so if you're interested, you can send me a message. That's it. Thanks, Brian. So next up is our Hot 3D session. Hot 3D is where we give hardware vendors the opportunity to talk about their innovations in architectural design. And this year we have one excellent presentation by Simon Fenny. Simon is with Imagination and has been there since 1992 in the Power VR division. And he will be telling us about how the architectures for hardware ray tracing at Imagination have evolved over time. So, Simon, whenever you are ready. When the plug wants to go in. Everybody give one round of applause for Simon. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as I said, I'm Simon. I'm a research uh, fellow at Imagination, and I've been with the PAL VR um, division since its inception nearly 31 years ago. So uh, in this talk, I just want to cover the hardware ray tracing uh, that we've been doing at Imagination for over a decade, um, from some of the early systems such as uh, Parsec and Wizard, uh, through to Photon, the latest technology we're offering to our customers. So what I would like to look at some of the principles that have remained relatively constant throughout, as well as some of the differences. Oh, and very briefly, if you're not familiar with Imagination, we develop IP, EG graphics, AI and CPUs, and then license them onto third parties to include in phones, computers, cars, TVs, that sort of thing. So a little bit about uh, imagination, caustic graphics. Now, as this talk is, part of this talk is retrospective. Uh, well, at uh, HBG 22, Aaron Lafon suggested using the DeLorean to go back in time, but as this is for ray tracing, I figure an axis aligned police box seems uh, more appropriate. So PAL VR began in 1992 as a project within Imagination, previously called Videologic, previously called Teletype. It's been going for ages, really. And the aim was to develop um, efficient rasterized graphics hardware, uh, basically tile-based deferred rendering. Now, Caustic Graphics began in 2006, and their aim was to develop efficient ray tracing. And we saw that their philosophies and aims were very much aligned with ours, so they became part of Imagination in 2010. Now, this, this bit's a bit of a, a show and tell. Um, so uh, in 2009, they released, uh, Caustic released Lux, which was an accelerator board for 3D visualization of ray tracing for the professional market. And that took in, that handled about 25 million incoherent rays per second. And I'll get onto incoherent if you're not familiar with that. And that was basically the FPGA predecessor uh, of uh, Parsec, uh, basically one of these things, which was a parallel BVH and triangle accelerator uh, using a 90 nanometer ASIC, so not super sophisticated at the time, um, and it did the shading on the CPU. So there were two products, Caustic 2100 and 2500. So this basically handled around about 100 million rays per second on a 65 watt board. <coughs> Then in 2015, uh, along came uh, Wizard, uh, which is basically a full mobile-sized GPU. Um, so a battery class, I think, was what Peter Shirley referred to them. Um, and that was doing over 100 million rays per second. Uh, the peak was much higher, actually, on a two-watt, I think, SOC. So basically something you would have in the phone. Um, the GPU was effectively a phone GPU, um, but didn't make it into a, into a phone product, unfortunately. And then in 2021, we announced Photon, uh, which is basically even smaller and or faster than the previous, um, which is kind of looking at 160 to 480 million rays per second, uh, depending on the config the customer wants. 
So a brief diversion onto incoherent rays. So, um, so primary rays that you fire out through the camera, basically rays coming from neighbouring pixels, pretty much will do the similar things as they go down through the BVH. They'll visit the same nodes for a lot of the way. Then you get onto secondary rays and they rapidly become less and less coherent with bounces. They're going all over the place. And then if you do stochastic global illumination rays, well, you've, you've got no chance of them being coherent. And your cache and memory subsystem, well, basically would be tortured if you don't do anything clever. So just want to look at what has remained in common between sort of the various generations and we'll concentrate on three things. Um, there's the automated, automated hardware BVH traversal and triangle testing. There's uh, ray and geometry coherency gathering so that you don't murder your memory system. And there's also shader coherency, basically so you're friendly to your SIMD. <coughs> now the BVH uh, traversal, so all the, generate, all the generations basically traverse their acceleration structure automatically. So the rays were tested against bounding volumes and triangles or you could also launch uh, procedural op um, operations if you got to um, an enclosed bounding volume that's marked that way. But there have been changes. So Lux and Parsec both used uh, bounding volumes which were made from the intersections of two or three spheres, um, which is great for snooker scenes, uh, you could mark a sphere as terminating, but it's pretty awful for build BVH building. So, Wizard and Photon very wisely moved to uh, AABBs. Now those are in, the, in our hardware are compressed format, so basically each node contains four or potentially more um, sub-boxes. And for that you don't need full, uh, full float precision. Now uh, we also have what we call coherency gathering, which avoids thrashing the memory system. So, if you consider your acceleration structure, your BVH, you need to be able to deal with completely arbitrary rays going down through it. So the systems basically maintain n packets of work and where each packet has an acceleration um, structure node ID where you are, plus a list of the rays that you want to test against the, the, the contents of that node, for example, AABBs. <coughs> So the system picks out a packet uh, using a heuristic. Uh, for example, if it picked out node B, then it will want to test Ray, say, 5, 99, 787 against it, against children E, F, and G. And so any hits that correspond to a box, so for example, if 787 uh, intersects uh, box E, that would then get added to E's packet. Now the packets are all completely dynamically managed, so as they become empty, they will get released into the system and be able to be added to other things. Also, triangle nodes can update the extents of the ray so that later tests uh, can eliminate boxes if they're further away. Also, uh, we do shader coherency, um, basically to be friendly to your SIMD. So this has been part of Imagination GPUs for Yonks. Uh, so PowerVR Series 2, even uh, say Dreamcast era, we would reorder the, uh, the shading work so that it was coherent. So if we saw that there were n scattered pixels in a tile all using a particular texture, they would be grouped together and operated on um, co um, coherently. And then that, the same thing happened then with shaders and that's all automatic. You don't have to worry about trying to do the sorting yourself. And it's the same with ray tracing. You don't want low occupancy of your shader units, so Parsec, Wizard and Photon all do sorting and gathering by the shader. So, uh, to make hardware useful, you need an API. So, uh, around 2010, we introduced OpenRL, which ran on Lux, Parsec and Wizard, and that was derived from OpenGL ES2, so it was aimed was to be familiar with developers. And that was a full ray tracing model. You had frame shaders, uh, basically ray gen, uh, vertex shaders for doing your object placement, and then ray shaders uh, for basically shading your hits, um, closest hit shader, for example. You could also do hybrid rendering, but it was a little bit inelegant. <coughs> so uh, later we, there was an OpenGL ES extension which basically supported both. Now, a brief diversion. So um, everyone knows ray tracing is recursive, isn't it? 
Well, if you, like me, were writing a ray trace professionally in the late 80s on an array of transputers in Occam, which is a parallel but non-recursive language, or like Andrew Garrard, her, my colleague who was developing ray tracing hardware, and you didn't want to stack shaders, or Caustic in the noughties, also wanting lots of rays in flight, then you might use fire and forget. So the basic concept is that each ray has an address, e.g. a pixel location, where it wants to write its results. It has some RGB attenuation weights and possibly also recursion depth. And then when a ray hits a surface, you immediately fire all new reflection, refraction, shadow rays, attenuating the ray weights appropriately. Uh, perhaps you also do any local ambient lighting and that sort of thing. And you in that case, you accumulate back to the pixel. And then you exit the shader, never to be seen again. Well, never to be seen again in this sense. And then the other rays that you've launched will come along and do their work at a later stage and accumulate their results back into that pixel. So back to uh, API evolution. Well, the OpenRL and OpenGL extensions weren't getting any traction. Um, basically, imagination simply aren't loud enough. But when Microsoft and then Kronos step in, um, there was suddenly a lot more interest in ray tracing. And the, perhaps the biggest change here is that it's a very CPU-like recursive model. You stack your shaders. Um, basically, fire and forget was fired and forgotten. Um, so Photon is designed to support these newer APIs, both Ray Pipeline and Ray Query, and it does the instancing with top-level acceleration structure and BLAS. Uh, we actually had considered instancing previously, but assumed that everyone would want to do skinning and stuff, which would be a complete nightmare. Um, so we, we hadn't considered doing that before. OK, so uh, what has evolved? Uh, what have we learned along the way? And how did we make sm uh, Photon even smaller? <coughs> well, so as I said, Wizard and Photon both use AABBs. But Wizard uses Pluka coordinates. Um, there's an interesting talk by uh, James McComb at Seagrass 2013, uh, which is well worth watching. So in Pluka coordinates, you basically test the ray against the box's six silhouette edges all in parallel, which is great for hardware. And that tr the system trades divisions for multiplies because multiplies are cheaper than divisions. And in uh, Wizard, you basically did that required 15 multiplies, nine adds or subtracts. And they were um, uh, made to be conservative, so you rounded down and rounded up appropriately. And they also included the ray interval test. Now, we wanted Photon to be smaller. Um, so we wondered, can we do the Ray ABB test with less hardware? <laughs> so going back in time again, we revisited other Ray ABB tests, uh, Kankajias and Smiths. And that reminded us, well, it reminded me, because most of the team are, are younger than power they are, um, of how the Series 1 rendered objects. So it, they were basically built out of the intersections of planar half spaces. And the graphics library gave the hardware all the front facing faces and then all the rear ones. And then for each pixel, it found the furthest front face and then the nearest rear plane and made sure that the front was in front of the rear. So we wondered, could we use this to do less work, i.e. use less silicon, uh, though possibly with higher latency? So um, in the photon ray box test, um, we translate the AABB by the ray origin, so everything's kind of moved into local space. Then we make the ray direction, can oh, sorry, this is a bit of a deep dive, I apologize. Um, then we make the ray direction canonical, so basically permute the ray and ABB axes and flip the signs so that the ray direction is always positive and that Z is greater than Y and that Z is greater than X. Uh, then, in effect, we kind of scale by one on Z and compute the inverses. So, in effect, the ray direction becomes Z divided by X and Z divided by Y, one, which needs two reciprocal operations and two moles. Uh, that cost is amortized over multiple AABBs. But what of division by zero, you scream? Well, we'll get back to that. And FP precision consistency, where well, we used exactly the same operation for the ray triangle tester, so everything is consistent. So I apologize, much of this was done during lockdown, so it's a little bit hazy in my memory. But to be safe, the AABB is expanded, basically by setting some bits in the, in the floating point, to include the floating point error of the AABB testing 
and also the worst case error that you get with the ray triangle tester, because you don't want holes in your geometry appearing. Uh, the first thing it does is it checks the T min and T max of the ray against the octants, so you can do an early out. I say early out, but you can't actually skip stuff in a pipeline hardware, so what it really does is just uh, clock gate the remaining hardware so that it doesn't do any calculations and saves power. Then it computes the distances to the box planes. That just needs four moles because Z is effectively free because we've scaled it that way. And then we get the, front, the, the, the max front distance and the min of the rear and just basically make sure rejected if the front is greater than the rear. And we again bake in some, some conservative safety margin and also do the T min, T max test. So how do we deal with those meddling zeros? Um, well, the AABB test is, well, has to be conservative, so we can make it a little bit more conservative. Now, as we're specifying the hardware, we can basically start with IEEE float and then add more exponent bits. So we introduce these special infinitesimal values which are less than the normal float min. And then any zeros in the stuff are remapped to those values. And then all the messy cases are completely mopped up by just doing normal floating point ex um, exponent calculations. Now, to compensate, um, you don't need all 23 bits of, a, of the Mantissa in the AAB test. It, it really is overkill. So we can basically prune off some of the bits there to get the, some area. Uh, so some other changes that uh, happened with Photon rel Relative Wizard 1, we added the instance transform unit. So if you want to do instancing, uh, the bottom level acceleration structures, they're placed in with uh, standard sort of matrices. And so you don't transform your geometry because that's expensive. You in instead inverse transform your ray. So you could do it with that sort of matrix. But we don't do that. We do it in two stages. We basically do an inverse translation first, followed by the rota inverse rotation and scaling. Now, that loses you some fuse multiply add uh, convenience, but it gains accuracy where you need it. And some things were removed, so Wizard had a hardware BVH builder uh, called the SHG, and that built the acceleration structure on the fly. As the vertex shader output batches of triangles, it would gather them up and sort of merge as, as needed into a hierarchy. But any silicon in an SOC is money, uh, so Photon instead uses compute. <coughs> uh, other things we did. Uh, so both Wiz and Photon test rays against triangle pairs. I've been harping on about this all week. Um, so we have a dual triangle tester. But using the tricks we learnt from doing the AAB tester, we managed to reduce the number of maths ops relative to Wizard by quite a bit. But that's uh, probably a whole talk in itself. Anyway, so what's the sort of, current, sort of overall architecture? So in the system, we can have some number of what we call racks, uh, the ray acceleration cluster. And sitting in the center of that, you have a box primitive scheduler. So what that does is it grabs a packet out of the, of, of the packet system and gets the rays which are associated with that and sends them on to either the dual triangle tester, the ABB or the procedural texture, uh, tester, gets back results, updates the packet, etc., getting data out of a, a cache for the acceleration structure. Any rays that then actually finally hit their, um, their final triangles are then put into a ray task scheduler to make sure that we try and keep similar um, shading operations, uh, um, as many similar shading operations being sent to the, um, the shader units as possible to keep it fully occupied. But this is graphics, so we need some pictures. Um, so this is basically... Uh, one of these, uh, this is a dead one, unfortunately. Um, Wizard One sitting in a small Linux machine. <clears throat> it's, a, again, a mobile class GPU, so very low powered. Uh, and this is a demo that uh, was basically videoed off the screen. The captures unit decided not to work, so it's from an SSLR, so I'm sorry about that. So it's, uh, it's your typical, uh, let's do lots and lots of reflections off curved surfaces, shadows. I, there may be a couple of bounces. There's no collision detections, as you can see. Um, and the surface is also bump mapped so that the, the reflection rays are kind of incoherent. Um, obviously, we've got like a glossy, not smooth reflection on one of the teapots. And a 
second one, if that wasn't obvious enough, that it was ray tracing, you can write, write it in massive great glass letters. Um, and obviously this one's also got proper um, translucency refraction, that sort of thing. So I think this must have several bounces. Unfortunately, I don't know who wrote the, uh, this demo. So that, um, there's obviously quite a few levels of height of uh, um, recursion in this one. <coughs> I say recursion, but this was using fire and forget, so there really wasn't any recursion. OK. Now, I can't show you photon running because it's not physically made yet. Um, I think uh, David McAllister said it would be a little while before the work he's working on now would become in the SOC IP licensing, it's even longer. Um, now, this is a hybrid um, ray tracing demo because we kind of expect that on the mobile end, a lot of the demos that are ray tracing will actually be hybrid. Uh, so this one is just showing um, that you can do uh, GI effects using uh, ray tracing and light probes. Um, so basic idea, you got a scene. The, the wall on the left is basically contributing some lighting to the wall on the right. And as the, um, I think it's either a cloud or a giant balloon going overhead, <coughs> shadows it, it changes the lighting on the right. I mean, people have, should be all quite familiar with this. Um, and to emphasize the fact, um, just take away most of the texture. Um, but basically, you can see as the, um, the shadow moves away, it starts becoming more and more yellow, uh, as you'd expect. And then, come on, come on, it's going to do it in a moment. <laughs> just sped up. As you change the material, obviously, you get uh, the same sort of effect over on the, on the wall as it, as it changes. OK, another, another, again, hybrid demo. This time it's ray tracing from the G buff. And the idea was to show, not really very, very visible, but uh, you could use, you can either use the traditional shadow maps, but you've got to obviously pick the right version of the umpteen different shadow map algorithms so that you get, um, you try and avoid any jaggy um, artifacts from under sampling. <coughs> but why not just fire rays? It's just easier. Um, Alternatively, I'm oh no, sorry, and this one also is showing uh, reflections. Now, this is unfortunately a bit too subtle. But basically, the floor, the piece of art, and the entire entirety of the diver are all reflective. Uh, kind of, there's like a, a previous, another example up there that's sort of showing what's going on. So he's, he's reflecting the entire, or the whole thing's reflecting the entire scene, which obviously is a bit more painful if you try to do in rasterization by updating cube maps, et cetera, et cetera. It's just all done in one fell swoop. And that's the end of the demos. And just like to say th some acknowledgements to the various colleagues, past and present, who helped fill in the, uh, the gaps in my knowledge. And thank you. There's any questions? Thank you, Simon. We have a little bit of time for questions. There's one. I think I can't throw that far. Awesome talk, Simon. Thank really you. enjoyed it. Uh, could you comment a little bit on the cache hierarchy of the different hardware through the generations? Because this is really important, usually. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I only know what the cache height. Well, OK. I don't know what was happening in Parsec. No idea. Uh, in Wizard, it will be very similar to Photon. So you've. There is a, there is a uh, acceleration structure cache just for the ray tracing, which then pulls in data from a more of a systemy level L2 sort of cache. Um, I know we tend to get about a 90% hit. Well, I believe we get we about a 90% hit rate on that cache, so it's it's quite an effective thing for reducing your external bandwidth, which on a mobile device you want because it uses a lot of power. Um, I think that's that's basically it's just. Nothing more sophisticated than that, really. OK, thanks a lot. Behind you. Oh. Thanks. Thank you for the great talk. Um, do you have a comment on how the hit rate changed from moving from spheres to ABBBs? No, it's, it's, that's way before my, my time. Um, probably quite significantly, um, because I know what the peak, well, I feel that the peak rate of the 
of, of this, that, that particular check, was a lot higher than the measured um, value, um, values of, that they were getting. So I suspect that it's not great. Um, it's, it is painful trying to build an acceleration structure out of spheres. Fair. <laughs> Thank you. For questions? Uh, yes. Um, can I start with? Where? Um, <laughs> take a pick. <laughs> Whoever grabs it. <laughs> uh, okay, my question is about passes. So a lot of uh, ray tracing APIs are based on rays. Uh, you, you give it a bunch of rays and it uh, gives you intersections. But is there any kind of benefit of having passes where all the next uh, ray basically starts where previous ray ends, and is there any benefit of knowing that and somehow utilizing that knowledge? Well, there's, there's nothing stopping you if, once you've got an intersection firing another ray immediately. I mean, the hardware we've got wants you to throw as many rays as you can at it as possible. Um, we've certainly seen some <clears throat> benchmarks which aren't firing that many rays, which is quite disappointing. It's hard to keep, it's hungry, it wants to eat rays. Um, so you need to you keep it fed. Um, uh, as long as you're, I'm not really sure. I mean, it's, as long as you're, you're giving it rays, it, it should it should be fine. I mean, it's, it's going to try and find the coherency of, of of things and and test them and try and keep the the system running efficiently. Um, yeah, maybe I, so I didn't phrase my question uh, properly. Basically, the question is. When you do intersection, uh, you already know where in, you're in the BVH you are. So where, where is this intersection in your BVH? And for the next ray, you basically kind of throw away that knowledge and you try to start it from the scratch to, to first find where you are in the BVH and then continue from there. Uh, we, we, we do do that. We don't currently um, try to take advantage of where you're starting from. But... It doesn't seem to matter too much. Um, I mean, if you're assuming that your rays are going off in, a, in another direction, it's, it's probably only going to be, maybe you lose a couple little bit of efficiency on, on a few top levels of your acceleration structure. Um, but it doesn't really, after you've got past that, you're, you're kind of back to where you, you would get if you kind of had some extra information to say, I'm starting here, use a different acceleration structure. If, if that's what you, you're asking. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, last question. Uh, yes, but basically, is this impossible or very difficult for BVH? So I agree. But my question is about power efficiency because uh, if I remember from slides, you it was two watts uh, yeah. con power consumption, mm -hmm. which seems to me amazing, so very great. So can you somehow compare, for example, for one ray, the power consumption with some competitive solutions? Or <laughs> uh, big, big, I, know, I know there was a demo um, that had a competitor's hardware of the same vintage as this uh -huh. doing the same test. Now, I'm not sure whether there might... There may have been a couple of these boards in this machine. So it, I, unfortunately, I can't find the people who people move on. But if it, it may have been four of these boards in there, so that would be, what, eight watts possibly of, of GPU. I can't yes. count the memory. And it was running much faster than something which was a two or 400 watt board. Yeah. So... I, is that good enough? Um, it's basically... <laughs> uh, let's see if I've got it. It was... Basically, this, this was basically um, written and uh, we're running on both um, the wizard card and a bigger GPU uh, than we make. And, uh, yeah, it was running faster. Great. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, let's move on. Simon will be around, so you can ask him all of your questions still. Um, I would like to call out that this session has been organized by Aaron Noll, who is not here today, so I am session chair. 
but uh, let's give another round of applause for Simon and for Erin. And now it's time for a few announcements and then we will transition into the closing and award session. Okay, first we have Birin Meyer presenting closing and awards I assume. Hi. So we're coming to an end. Three days of uh, exciting stuff about high performance graphics are finally concluding. And um, yeah, we have a, some announcements to make. And um, David, the general chair, and I uh, would like to close this uh, conference now with, um, with the awards. And this is uh, due to, or we, we've named the award. Uh, after Wolfgang Strasser, one of the pioneers of computer graphics, um, who passed away too early. Um, and to commemorate uh, this fellow, uh, we named the award after him. So I would like to now call out for the paper's chair, Christian Gribble and Jakob Bieker, uh, to announce the winners and the collateral that comes with it. Thank you. So. Um, yeah, we had a very quick voting session, and I'm very grateful for your uh, cooperation with that. Uh, and uh, that got us uh, three papers that uh, definitely uh, stood out, according to you. Uh, and um, we are going to announce those. Oh, yes, I should mention that uh, if you are uh, uh, the one of the authors of the best paper, or the second best paper, or uh, the third, then uh, you will receive a prize. And uh, the prize is uh, one Intel ARC A7700 uh, card. And there will also be an AMD FPGA card uh, for you. Um, so with that shared, can I give the, word, uh, the, the microphone to, uh, to Christian for the third prize? All right, so uh, in third place, we have Daniel Chutmoral, yes. Uh, Edge Friend, Fast and Deterministic Cup Model Clerk Subdivision Surfaces. And in second place, Sampling visible GGX normals with spherical caps. Okay. All right, and finally, your uh, 2023 Wolfgang Strasser Best Paper Award goes to real-time rendering of glinty appearance using distributed binomial laws on anisotropic grids. So thank you very much to all our authors and uh, a hearty congratulations to these Best Paper Award winners. Uh, we thank you for your participation. Okay, so uh, we uh, try to figure out one more thing and that is uh, if we look back for 10 years and we look to the year 2013 and the papers that have been presented at, AP, uh, at HPG uh, in that year, uh, which of those papers actually stood the test of time and which of those papers uh, got the most citations according to Google Scholar? Uh, we uh, actually investigated and uh, we found out that there is uh, one paper that actually stood out. Drum roll again. And that paper is Fast Parallel Construction of High Quality Bounding Volume Hierarchies, which is 
definitely a paper that is being read and used a lot, has been used a lot in the past 10 years. So uh, give a round of applause to those authors. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, speaking of thanking people, this, um, this event would not have been possible with all the incredible work from those people who are listed here. We had bi-weekly meetings and uh, we did a lot of organization. But when it comes down to the actual place, we have to give a big round of applause to the local uh, chairs, Elma Eisenman over here, Andrew Cotter, who really, really saved the day, saved the three days. And of course, um, I was particularly, as a, as a uh, person who's teaching, I'm always uh, excited about uh, people from the student, uh, from, stu from, the, from the student people uh, that we have around here. Uh, Rosalie DeWint, an artist from Kralingen, who took over the very important role and very uh, responsible role of Registrar, so they took a lot of responsibility here. Let's give them a round of applause to our students. And we should mention also the uh, student staff that uh, Theo Delft helped us. They secretly run around and helped us. They guided us to the boat and, and all that stuff. So thanks to those again. <laughs> all right, so um, what's coming up next? So um, eventually this would not have been possible without the sponsors here. Oops, that seems an auto transition. Well, appreciate our sponsors here for, an, for another second, uh, which really made this, this event possible. So what's coming up next? Uh, after 23, um, there's traditionally coming 24. So we'll have a uh, next round of HP, HPG. We've not finally determined the actual date, but uh, throughout the history of HPG, we've been doing this on the Friday to Sunday before SIGREF, but don't book flights yet. It's not yet clear. Uh, we have to figure it out, but SIGGRAPH, they're a little bit earlier than we are. They are probably on July 28th to Thursday, uh, August 1st. Well, so, what's next today? We'll have lunch. And then, um, no, the other way around. We have, uh, each is our opening remarks, and then we have lunch. So flip those two points real quick. Uh, mentally, and then we have at 12.45 our HBG town hall meeting and I invite all the HBG attendees to join here in this room. Uh, David and I will uh, try to um, toss in some topics that we can discuss about how to improve the, uh, our conference here. And then um, the next item would be at 1.30, I believe, the keynote by Tummy. Um, and then there's other stuff going on, but uh, please go on the website and check it out. So thank you very much for coming. and. Uh, I hand over to Alma for the opening remarks for EGSR, and then we have lunch. So I wish I could do this immediately, but of course that's the moment when PowerPoint freezes and dies on you. But um, so if it's not coming back, I have to do it a little bit orally, and I show you the slides again later. What is very important to note is that we are going to have the lunch break in a few minutes outside of this building, so where you also took the coffee. But there's not only lunch, there are also two different opportunities to connect. One is that there is a European project that will be presented, whose name is eDiploma, and uh, they will show you a little bit of what kind of work they're currently doing, and they sign up to this EGSR European uh, project presentations. The idea is to revolutionize learning by integrating modern technologies like VR and AR, and you can also participate in a demo that shows you a visualization of a hyperbolic space in VR. <laughs> After this, uh, there's also the opportunity, uh, now it's back, so let me quickly connect this. Working, perfect. So now we also have a nice animation to transition. <laughs> then, now that I can show the logos before saying anything else, I also want to say that this conference, of course, what, you will, what will now follow, would not have been possible without the sponsors of this event. In particular, we want to thank Reality Labs Research, who are all gold sponsors and really responsible for making this event a big success. We have Adobe and Activision that are also supporting us 
in uh, uh, here at this location. And thank you very much for all of them. And a quick round of applause, maybe even. Most of you should be connected by now, but if not, here are the three opportunities to enter our Wi-Fi. If you are on EduRoam, it's no problem, you can just connect with your standard credentials. If you are not, you can send an SMS to the telephone number and send the following small code that is listed there. The code will change every day. So tomorrow and Friday, you will get a new code. They're also hanging on the posters outside. It might not work for all telephones. There are some security reasons that ICT could not figure out yet, but you can share the login credentials with others if you trust them, and then you can all sign up immediately. If this is not the solution that you would like, there's a third option. You can send an email to the registrar at highperformancegraphics.org. You can include the uh, subject Wi-Fi and then just list your first name, last name, and telephone number, and you will get an SMS with the login credentials so that you can get online. Now, during the, the uh, coffee break, I already mentioned, there's this European project, eDiploma. As I said before, it's this uh, e-learning ecosystem that will be built over the f uh, following years. It's part of the Horizon 2021 Transformations call. And the project just started last year, so there's a lot of opportunity to learn about it. And we placed a QR code here so that you can also join the mailing list in case that you're interested. This project goes through four phases, basically examining the current e-learning system and then creating new methodologies to teach in a better way. And we will also try to make this kind of information and after the project accessible to everyone so that hopefully all can benefit from this. The host of the booth that will be outside is Amir Zaidi. The VR uh, demo that I mentioned is run by Ravi Schnellenberg, Scott Jochems, Martin Skrotsky, who are in the background and many more that worked on this. So again, Thank you uh, for joining this and testing it out. Then we have uh, another quick opportunity to stay connected. For those of you that are from the Netherlands, we have a Dutch Eurographics chapter, and it is now the moment to also take this opportunity to connect in case that you're interested. If you want to know why, well, it's all about visual computing and an opportunity to learn other or to get to know other people from the community. We give out best PhD awards, there are colloquia and workshops, game jams, and in general, opportunities to meet nice people to work together with in the future. And so I hope, if you are interested, that you would sign up to this mailing list to stay up to date of all following events. With this, what are the next steps? Well, you step outside of the building, as I said before, there is food. We did a quick poll beforehand to make sure that there's enough for everybody and also of the right type of food. Vegetarian came out on top, which I think is very nice to know. So we have a lot of vegetarian options. We have a few chicken and, uh, um, and turkey options. Then we have vegan food that is also provided. To those that are vegan, please uh, stick to it. The others, if you can eat vegetarian first, then please stick to vegetarian. There are meat options and fish. Please note, TU Delft is a non-smoking campus. So on the whole of the campus, you're not allowed to smoke any cigarettes. If you need to smoke, you unfortunately have to leave the campus two streets down here and then there's an opportunity for you to smoke. With these words, enjoy the lunch, and we see you back for the first keynote, note, and therefore the opening also of EGSR. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. One last thing. Is this one? Sorry, there's another announcement here by Andrew. One second. Hi, everyone. Sorry, one last thing. Uh, people expecting to collect Cornell boxes from me. I'll be outside now and before and after the town hall. So, see you there. <laughs>
Dank.
Bye.
Epidemic Sound is basically a royalty-free soundtrack company. So it's where I go to when I want to get my backing tracks for my YouTube videos. Pick whatever suits you, your mood, your content, etc. There's so much variety. It doesn't really matter if you're a video creator or if you create videos for clients. Mm -hmm. You can actually just pick whichever license works for you. And new tracks are added to their catalogue every single week. De nieuwe Opel Astra Sport Tourer Plug-in Hybrid spreekt voor zich. Level up. Ontvang nu een gratis upgrade en stap zonder meer prijs in een nog exclusievere uitvoering.
Skoda is supporter van Team Jumbo Visma. Daarom profiteer je nu van tourvoordeel. Zo rijd je direct weg in de elektrische Enyaq RV. Af vanaf 242 euro bijtelling per maand.
My great pleasure to uh, moderate this keynote session by Tami Bubeker, joint keynote session between HPG and EGSR. So a few words about Tami. Tami is a lab director of the Adobe Lab and a principal research scientist uh, Adobe in Paris. He also is a professor of CS at Ecole Polytechnique, also in Paris. Um, Tami did his PhD with INRIA in France. Um, I think Bordeaux it was, not in my records. Correct, Bordeaux? Bordeaux, Bordeaux it was. Um, he moved on. He's been a postdoc at Berlin, which I rec receive you enjoyed a lot. So it's great that you had your share of Germany. Because then he founded the uh, computer graphics group in uh, Telecom Paris Tech in Paris, um, where also I had the pleasure of working with Elma there. So good times. So about 2010, that was. Okay, so uh, so much about that. And, and Tommy, at the same time, is a good friend. So I recently read this bio of Alexandre Dumas, and I, I, I read like he wrote like an unbelievable number of books. He traveled the world. He was a leading economical, political figure of his time. And Alexandre Dumas was also running a bar. So then I thought, oh, is it still possible in our times? And when I, th I thought about that, I thought, oh no, Tommy, Tommy is such a character, and uh, I'm very, very proud to have him here today and to know such a person. So, yeah, without further ado, there's Tommy. He already secured uh, his place in the Pantheon of Graphics in France and maybe everywhere. And I'm very much looking forward to your talk, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias, for the, for the nice words. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, the, to the uh, organizers of HPG and AGSR for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm happy to talk a little bit about the kind of research uh, I do and we do with my group today. And uh, let's start with the title, maybe, because I got a lot of questions about like, what this title means. Uh, does anyone know what multum in parvo means? Yeah? Exactly. It's a Latin expression to express that you have a lot of things in a small tile, basically. And that's what led to MIP, MIP, MIP mapping that we use everywhere in graphics today. So that was coined in the 80s by uh, Lance Williams, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this is a topic for today. And MIP mapping and all the related concepts, level of details, multi-resolution processing, multi-scale analysis, are the things I'd like to, to focus on. Usually when I make a talk, I pick up a research challenge and then I show how the recent research I've been doing come together into one single piece that address the challenge. Uh, this talk is a bit different. I will go over the recent work we did with my group, and I will try to show each time how we leverage MIP mapping, shape approximation, multi-resolution, multi-scale analysis to address the problem. So it's mostly an overview with some insight on the importance of those concepts. Before I start, I'd like to uh, list and remind that this is definitely not the, the work of one person, but of a large group of, of people, among which talented students and interns, uh, Mateus Gadela, Alban Gauthier, Émilie Guy, Thibault Lescoat, Hélène Legrand, Bei Shen Li, Corentin Mercier, Eddie Michel, Liang Shi, Eric Trenley, and Tong Zhao. Uh, it has been a true pleasure to develop all those pro projects with them. Uh, at least one of them is here today. I hope some of them are online as well. A lot of Adobe researchers have been contributing to all those work. I won't list everyone. And we also engage with uh, the academic world and collaborate with faculty people. All right, so level of detail is a word that we'll use a lot today, as well as approximation in general. And this sequence is taken from one of our recent papers to just illustrate how much approximation models we leverage in graphics applications today. We have one for the shading model here, one for the illumination effect, one for ambient occlusion in screen space, one for the physics of uh, this animation where substitute coarse meshes are used instead of high resolution geometries to run this in real time. So I try to show that beyond speed and scalability, level of detail and shape approximation is a tool that is not only important, but also key and central to computer graphics research. A bit on, of context first. 
So I work at Adobe, and uh, most of our activities are orbiting around the 3D digital content creation pipeline, or DCC. Well, those notions are familiar to everyone here. The, the main breed of content that we manipulate are essentially 3D geometry, material models, and lighting conditions. And out of the three, we also provide, of course, all the services that you need to actually produce images out of this model. Now, of course, we have users that interact with those models, create them, manipulate them, edit them, assemble them into a current scene. And the more it goes, the more we see a hybrid creation mode where basically captured data is mixed with data that is designed by hand uh, in our tools to produce the final experience, whether it is an image or something more complicated. Now, level of details and approximation models are present everywhere in all those models and processes. And I will go over a few examples to show you how, how we use them. So in this talk, I will use uh, widely the, the term proxy. Uh, proxy to denote a particular level of detail. Proxy to denote how an approximation scheme takes place in an algorithm. Proxy also to denote the different levels of a MIP map hierarchy. Through the 3D DCC pipeline, I will try to address material and geometry as well as some element of a rendering. And I will mostly focus, of course, on uh, the work coming from our lab uh, with some perspective toward the end where I see opportunities for future research. And I took this image at the bottom to illustrate uh, this first this first part, uh, it's, a, it's an image taken from a, a work we did a couple of years ago called Bounding Proxies. It's a, it's a simplification of a mesh, but not a simplification meant to be uh, visually appealing or efficient at representing the appearance of the original object. It is meant to be conservative for any test you might have to do with the geometry. So bounding the original shape while being as tight as possible to it. So this is fairly far from a usual mesh simplification, what you see here. Yet it serves other purpose than the final appearance of shapes. It serves physics simulation and freeform deformation needs. And this is what I observed over the last two decades, maybe. The fact that techniques that were developed for real-time rendering were actually finding use for other use cases beyond the pure image uh, synthesis process. OK, let's start with the case of materials. Obviously, I was before the chief scientist of Substance 3D at Algorithmic, and so materials have played a major role in our activities over the last few years. One challenge we had to address over the last five years, maybe, was to provide our users with the ability to create digital materials out of a single image. And that's the first example where we, where we used level of detail processing to actually achieve that. So the idea is that you take as input a photo uh, taken in the wild, so no flash, uh, you know, uh, grounds, uh, rock cliffs, anything that you can find outside. And you generate from it a digital material model in the form of a collection of maps that drive the reflectance properties of uh, your, your material as well as, uh, as well as some geometric component. And I will come back on the geometric component. We play a, a growing role in all those material models. So you can see here on the left the input, on the right what we obtain as output. And this is definitely an ill-pose problem. So this is a good reason to use uh, deep learning and neural nets to actually leverage the, the statistical domain of uh, a large collection of data that we have assembled for this purpose to solve the most ill post part. And this ill post part essentially relies on two aspects. First, light plays a major role in what we perceive from the material and is actually making the task difficult when you try to reverse engineer albedo, roughness, normals, and so on. So the first task we really tried to address was to delight the input photo, while accounting for what made actually the technology interesting, which is its ability to capture not only microstructures, but also mesostructures, things which are a little bit bigger than a few pixels. The second task, which kickstarts the geometric part of the pipeline, is essentially to reconstruct a normal map out of this measurement, and for that we use a second, a second uh, neural model. Now, if you take those two models, which are actually units, which are trained on a, a custom synthetic data set, uh, you, you get results that works well at fine scale. But it's extremely hard to actually, actually reconstruct the mesostructure uh, at, at large scale. So we combine it with a two-scale scheme, where basically the same model is used to reconstitute the geometry at different scales at the same time. We don't have multiple models. We have a single one that is itself actually hierarchical. And then we run it at multiple scale on the input image so that we bring currency in the reconstructing maps. One decision we made here was that uh, we wanted to have the capacity of the model and essentially the, the power of your GPU and the, the amount of memory available on a GPU dedicated to the most ill-posed tasks. So 
only delighting and normals are actually reconstructed this way, and we combine it with a bunch of other algorithms to extract the, the remaining channels to obtain, in the end, such a material. So, again, same example as before with uh, the albedo map, the normal map that are extracted from this neural process, as well as roughness and eight, eight map that are extracted through additional algorithm following the neural processing. Now, you can see that it works fairly well, even if the material is not really a material, and that's something we had to cope with. Uh, what we call material in research might sometimes be pretty far from what a final user called material. I recall when I was a student, uh, and when I saw listed among the SVBRDF maps, the normal map, I was a bit shocked. For me, the normal had nothing to do with reflectance. It was part of the geometry and shouldn't be part of a SVBRDF model. As a matter of fact, not only the normal map, but also the displacement map and other things which are related to geometry are actually having a lot of success being understood and used as channels of the digital material model that people use. And that's something that motivated a bunch of uh, following work that I will describe a, a little bit later. Now, some, some first observations here. Uh, we have an explicit neural model where we explicitly feed uh, the model with multi-scale data so that it can reconstruct both micro and meso de details. Uh, the geometry that it extracts made it successful. In practice, this, shipping, this is shipping in two products at Adobe, Adobe Capture and Adobe Substance, and uh, the feedback has been, uh, has been great so far. Uh, one interesting aspect is that uh, the model can be extended to multiple scales. I only showed here the use with two scales, and in practice, that was enough. So I won't be extreme in the multi-scale uh, you know, uh, discussion. Sometimes, and actually very often, two or three scales are enough. And that's also something I'd like to discuss toward the end of this presentation. Now, this was a simple example to, to kickstart the, the keynote. The, the juice of what we do at Substance is definitely not about uh, static materials, but dynamic ones. So let me now move to what we call parametric materials. What you see here is actually one asset. The geometry of this asset and the materials of this asset are actually unique. And what we have here is actually variations of, over the hyperparameters of the parametric material and geometry that compose this scene. This is uh, an emerging workflow where you try, you, you try to avoid creating content which is purely static and let a few degrees of freedom so that the amount of work you put into creating one scene can actually lead to hundreds of different scenes by just exposing a few high-level parameters. So if we, if we go back to the specific case of materials, so far I've been discussing materials as a SVB RDF composed of multiple maps that model, again, reflectance and geometry of the material. And now I'm transitioning to materials expressed as programs, as directed acyclic graphs, which are essentially the modern form of procedural textures, only the procedural aspect is, just, is not just a noise function or some filter, it's an entire graph of operators that defines the signal over the UV domain. Uh, just so that we are all on the same page, let me quickly go over what is a material program today. So as I said before, it's a direct it's a directed acyclic graph made of nodes and edges. The nodes are typically of three kinds. Generators that create actually content in the UV space. Filters, which have to be understood in their most general form. They take as input textures, produce as output textures. And data stores, because the more it goes, the more you see hybrid uh, materials, where part of the material is actually, is actually coming from the capture process, and another part is coming from the proceduralization of the content. Now, what exists on the edge are actually the, a, a flow of maps that feed a particular material model, typically a microfacet model uh, driven by the GG, GGX NDF. And for that, the typical output of this graph are the albedo, roughness, conductivity, normal, or 8 map, up to many more channels in the modern uh, shading models, but uh, let's just uh, stick to, to those one. One aspect which is interesting with those materials is that they run entirely on GPU, which means that the synthesis of those map never go over the CPU to then go back to the GPU. Everything is done live on the GPU, which means that even at high resolution, you can edit and control in real time this content. And this is what makes that kind of engine successful. Uh, I'm describing here, of course, the, the Substance engine, but other engines are also uh, working this way. Now, I will focus on materials, but the same is true for shapes and lighting environments. 
So what's the, the actual benefit of all of that? Well, it's resolution infinite. You can expose a few hyperparameters that drastically change the content of your material. The term material becomes much wider when you uh, create content this way. Uh, you can see at the bottom what a given material gives when it's applied on just two triangles, right? Those wheels are made of two triangles. Texture map with the output of a material graph that has a rich geometric mesostructure, as well as a rich opacity map. So you can see the appeal that this represents, for instance, for real-time applications, where in the end, most of the geometric content lives in the material maps, which is easy to tile, filter, stream, uh, and make level of detail of. Now, of course, uh, the first project I was mentioning was about capture. This one is about designing material graphs. Can we bridge the two worlds? Can we actually capture material graphs? And that was the topic of a fairly large project that we had uh, three years ago called Match where the challenge was to actually, given an input photo, as before, be able to obtain a material graph that would reproduce it. Um, it was a challenge in the sense that uh, what has to be optimized is actually a, a program, like you know, any DAG is actually a program, and that's particularly, particularly true for, for materials. And you can see here a few examples of what we obtain. It's essentially, it's essentially a, a two-stage process, where you first seek for a material graph in a database that could under some variation match to your input image before optimizing the parameters of this graph so that you, you, finally, uh, you finally obtain uh, details, colors, normals, roughness that corresponds to the, the appearance of the input photo. So you see on the left each time the initial graph that was retrieved and in the middle after optimization what we obtain. Now there are two parts in match but really the important one, the one that makes it useful for the subsequent project is the, is the one that optimize the parameters. The key idea at that time, which is now actually used in many other projects, is that we can use the mechanism of, this, of deep learning, but through a different object than a neural net. And in particular, what we do in practice is that we back propagate from the image through the graph to optimize all the parameters of our material graph, exactly the same way as you back propagate uh, from a given loss or the gradient of a loss uh, toward, uh, through, through a neural net in traditional machine learning. So that proved to be uh, fairly successful. And when it comes to level of details, I think it's, it's an interesting approximation scheme because this is an approximation scheme, although you may have extremely sharp features, very detailed content. But the approximation does not lie in the L2 sense. What we use to actually match images with the output of our graph is a style loss. So the style loss will make sure that statistically over a small window, similar structures are recovered but you cannot guarantee that you will have the exact same grain or the exact same features as the one uh, present in the input image. That was uh, actually a, a challenge to get something that, that would be stable enough, but in the end, for many, for many application scenarios, the byproduct of this process is that although you may not have exactly the material that you wanted first, what you have is something which is resolution infinite, and that has a lot of value in practice. Of course, the material remains editable. You can manipulate the, the, the various uh, hyperparameters that are attached to the material. And, and that's a practical concern for many users, uh, tileable. Tileability of a material uh, sample is actually a, a deciding factor between using it or not using it in production uh, in many cases. So the notion of approximation with match lies in the detail color spectrum, not in the features. You won't get blurry result, but you might get something which is slightly off. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the structure of the micro details and the meso details. And of course, the whole process is bounded to the maximum expressiveness of the set of graphs you were first uh, searching from. Therefore, why not move into the next step, which is synthesizing the graph explicitly? Well, that's a much more complicated problem. It's related to program synthesis, and we actually tackled part of it with another project called Matformer. So Matformer is a generative model that essentially generates material graphs uh, after a training of a, large of a large collection of procedural ones. So you can see here a few, uh, a few examples of uh, what this uh, generative model produces. It produces graphs which are very similar to the one we use every day with our uh, material suite. And it provides also, uh, uh, beyond the generative aspect, a few useful applications such as graph autocompletion. Like, if you start to make a graph by yourself, you can use Matformer to complete it. How does it work? Uh, essentially, 
a graph, a material graph, may have long-range dependencies between the different nodes that compose it. So transformers appear to be uh, the right tool to actually predict what could be the structure and the values of, uh, of a material graph. In practice, Matformer is actually a, a triplet of uh, three transformers, one that predicts nodes, one that predicts the values of, uh, contained in the parameters of the nodes, and one that predicts the edges among the nodes. As a result, you get a generative model that, then get, that can generate an infinity of uh, material graphs, which are all fully editable, titleable, because that was a property shared by many of the graphs uh, we trained from, and that can be used to create content, but also to uh, perform the last miles of the material creation process, where the initial structure of the material is designed by a user, and then the rest of the graph, which can contain up to hundreds and hundreds of nodes, is actually synthesized. Now, let me switch gears and discuss similar notions, approximation level of details and multiscale processing, but in the context of geometry and, and shapes, essentially. So a lot of work has been done in the community uh, regarding this aspect, whether regarding geometry processing purely, geometry analysis, or freeform modeling. Level of detail and shape approximation models have been used uh, at every stage. Uh, let me just put a little bit of context here. Uh, in the content creation pipeline, when we start to use capture data, it always starts by assembling together uh, point clouds, so that once registered, the point clouds can lead to an input to a reconstruction algorithm. This reconstruction algorithm is typically meant to generate a surface out of the point cloud, and then start the traditional computer graphics task, where you simplify, compute the UV map, subdivide, remesh, animate, skin, and so on and so forth. But the initial step is ready to go from capture, measure data, to a surface model. Now, there is a standard algorithm for that, uh, one that is very successful, and when I was uh, younger, I've been studying this algorithm quite a lot. That's Poisson surface reconstruction. I'm pretty sure many of you know this algorithm. It has been uh, really an enabler for all our friends in computer vision to actually get good meshes out of 3D measurements. This algorithm is essentially uh, estimating, estimating a gradient on the, of, a, of an indicator function, which is essentially a function in space that tells you whether you are in the reconstructed shape or outside. And solving for a Poisson system that essentially associates the the divergence of the, of the normal field of your point cloud with the Laplacian of this indicator function, you reconstruct a, a, a surface mesh. The surface mesh is actually extracted with a marching cube uh, at the very end of the process. Now, <coughs> one pitfall of uh, the, the traditional way of doing surface reconstruction is that you need to discretize the space to solve a system at some point. And the only cue you have to discretize the space is to actually look at where the points were uh, initially and then uh, try to make sure that you have a partition of the space that account for their presence. Now, if you do surface reconstruction, that happens often that part of the surface re you reconstruct is actually far away from the points. That's, that's actually the main interest in powerful surface reconstruction algorithm, to reconstruct uh, large holes and uh, you know, fill space where you had actually no data with something reasonable. So there are two ways of discretizing space, uh, using an arc tree, typically, that was in the original paper, or using a, a tetraidization, the Delaunay tetraidization of the, of the space. And in both cases, the initial discretization is often suboptimal. And it leads to wrong assumption about where the surface should go and wrong level of detail in the way you solve the system and provide degrees of freedom to the final surface. And you can see here many artifacts that stem from uh, such examples. So we adopted a progressive approach, which is, again, another mechanism that comes from multi-scale processing, to try not only to reconstruct the surface, but also to reconstruct the right discretization of the domain. That's why, it, that's why it's called progress, progressive discrete domains, where in an iterative process, we not only reconstruct the surface, we actually progressively improve the discretization of space that led to the surface. So think about it as an interactive algorithm where each step is actually a Poisson surface reconstruction, and in between, we interleave an optimization of the discretization of the space. You can see multiple steps of this process, and this gives actually a fairly good results in challenging cases where a lot of data is missing for large holes or spiky features. Now, this is one extreme of a spectrum. Like, this is a slow algorithm in practice. I think about like tens and tens of iterations of the Poisson surface reconstruction, which is itself a fairly slow process. There are other ways to reconstruct a surface, and one of them is uh, to use another family of reconstruction mechanism called moving least squares, or MLS. 
Moving these square surfaces leave at another extreme. They do not need any system solving. They can work locally independently of, uh, when you reconstruct many points, they can be independently reconstructed uh, all in parallel. And uh, they are very versatile. versatile. So you can adapt it to the amount of data you have uh, available. You can adapt it to the kind of features that exist on your point set uh, in the input. And although they are extremely fast, they support from something that uh, is a showstopper for many applications, which is a local support nature. It means that the geometry you reconstruct will only account for the neighboring sample point that you add in the input. So that's why we tackle uh, this problem with something that we call last year moving level of detail surfaces. The idea was theoretically you can express an MLS surface with a global support, avoiding all the pitfalls of local support, no hole, no discrepancy, something extremely spruce, even at very large scale. In practice, it's impossible to use because think about a million points as input, evaluating the function of, that defines this surface at a given location in space would be in big O of N at best. So no way to use that. That's why people rely on the k-nearest neighbors. And we found a way to actually uh, combine the benefit of both, the speed of local schemes with the quality of global, of global schemes. All of that thanks to level of details. And in a nutshell, I will try to explain quickly how this works. So a moving list where surface is expressed as the fixed point of a projection operator, which means that if I apply the operator in space and I do not move by applying it, I am on the surface. That's the definition of an MLS surface. And when you evaluate it in space, what you usually do is that you, you're going to wait, you're going to center a weighting kernel at the evaluation location and then weight all the input samples with this uh, weighting kernel. Based on this weighting, you're going to fit a geometry primitive and that's going to be the support onto which you will project the space. Uh, this is where the, the performance issue lies. If you want to be robust to large holes, you have to collect a lot of neighbors to actually uh, before actually fitting your geometry primitive, and that's intractable in practice. So that's why people typically use K and N instead of the wall P as input, and this leads to poor quality. And that's here that kickstart our ID. Instead of weighting the entire point cloud with uh, a weighting kernel, what we do is that we, do, we compute an X-dependent level of detail of the entire point cloud before actually doing the fitting process. In other words, for the rendering people in the room, that's applying the principle of light cuts, but to the MLS evaluation problem, where we gather an approximation that is evaluation dependent of the wall geometry before uh, proceeding with the, the actual projection. And you can see on the right something we obtained almost in real time, where we browse the different scales at which we can reconstruct the surface up to very fine detail with a quality that almost match Poisson surface reconstruction at a speed that is comparable to local uh, MLS schemes. So we applied it on a, on a bunch of, uh, of schemes. One, one scheme that is extremely efficient with it is the algebraic point set surface model introduced by Genevo and colleague in 2007, where the geometric primitive you fit is actually an algebraic sphere. Now, I, I was just talking about, you know, reconstructing a shape by approximating locally it with a geometric primitive, a plane, an algebraic sphere, or something like that. There is a task in graphics that has been around for 30 years, like between graphics and vision, which is actually recognizing such shapes in 3D data. Like, how do you recognize that a complex object is made of a few simple ones? Simple being cylinders, cones, spheres, cube. Uh, this is a very ill-posed problem, and uh, a problem for which solutions very often do not scale extremely well. Uh, we, we actually worked on that and again applied a multi-scale and level of detail scheme to try to address this challenge with something called CPFM, so Cascaded Primitive Fitting Network, where we essentially started from the state of the art in this field, which was a recent neural method that would essentially detect a simple primitive out of a few tens of thousands of points. And we tried to derive a multi-scale approach out of it. So if you take this, this object here on the left, ideally you'd like to decompose it into a couple of cylinders and a plane, mostly. And if you do that, you solve a lot of problems on the way. Like part of the surface reconstruction problem is solved. A lot of application can work directly with the fitted primitive instead of the original data. It's, it's an interesting output to obtain. Our architecture works at two scales. Again, two scales, no, not more. A fine scale where basically we run the neural model locally so that we detect for a small set of points what would be the set of primitives that would explain it the best. And we do pretty much the same at a global scale where we subsample the entire point cloud and then try to find a set of primitives that explain this subsampling. 
Then the idea is to find uh, an agreement between the two sets of primitives so that in the end we extract a meaningful set of primitives that covers both small features and large structures. And this is what we obtained here. Uh, it was a step forward, but I have to say we, we still have a lot of work to do to make it really scale to large amounts of data. We gained maybe an order of magnitude compared to a previous state of the art, and we are still actively working on the, this particular task, which is both um, simple to state, but actually fairly hard to, to address. Now, you can go a step further and try to rely entirely on learning, not seeing learning as a way to filter data or fit primitives, but as a way to actually express your approximation. This is another direction that we've been following uh, pretty much at the same period of time by studying and developing uh, generative 3D proxy models. So a generative model whose task is to, is to actually approximate a given shape. And we did that with a, a specific neural architecture that on one side em employ a fairly simple generator, actually the simplest you can come up with, which is a variational autoencoder. Well, nowadays, I mean, it's three years old, so it's very old by deep learning standard. Uh, nowadays, we would probably revisit that with a diffusion model, typically, but it doesn't change the, the basic principle where when we try to approximate a shape with a, a small set of primitives, we work in two stages. We first try to predict the existence of a given primitive before predicting the parameters of this uh, particular primitive. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit of a twisted way of thinking about uh, primitive fitting because predicting the existence of something while you're actually computing might sound exotic, but in practice it allows to vectorize the problem so that we would actually be compatible with uh, generative models which have like a fixed size input and a fixed size output, something that you don't know when you start uh, analyzing a shape. So we did that with uh, supervised uh, data, but also with a kind of self-supervision using an automatic uh, shape approximation algorithm, and it gives rise to a interesting latent spaces. An interesting, you know, the, the set of shapes you can query from this generator are actually uh, maybe good candidates to manipulate the shape at core scale. Uh, I will transition to that in a second, but the original idea of this project was not to generate a, a replacement for the object, but a set of handles, hence the, the name of the paper actually, generative handles, handles that would allow you to manipulate the shape interactively without av having to build yourself uh, cages, skeletons, or a set of key points on the surface. This presentation is an overview of all those, uh, those projects, so let me uh, move forward with another aspect of the 3D DCC pipeline where the notion of scale has been critical. And we just move a little bit further in the, in the creation pipeline toward the editing phase where the user is meant to interact with uh, the 3D content. Uh, two years ago, we introduced something called DAG amendments to manipulate parametric shape interactively in a WYSIWYG fashion. And the idea was that given a parametric shape with a set of hyperparameters, how can I translate the simple user input of clicking somewhere and dragging into an update of the exposed and available hyperparameters. The idea was to make interaction with those graph-based shapes as simple as when you manipulate a mesh or an implicit surface uh, on screen. Now, I, I won't have time to describe in detail the whole system, but there was one key feature in, uh, in, this, uh, in this system that involved the, the scale analysis, which is that it is, again, an ill pose problem. If I only prescribe one point on a surface and prescribe a translation of this point into the R3D space, there are multiple modifications of the hyperparameter set that could explain this transformation. Instead, what we did was to enrich the input of the user with the notion of scale. So typically in this example here, the user will not only define uh, what's the size of a, uh, what's the position of an interaction with the shape, but also at which scale the, the interaction should occur. This allows to distinguish the, the small knob from the drawer itself from an entire door by just changing the scale at which the interaction is meant to be expressed. In practice, this allows also to have a more stable differentiation of uh, the, the world graph so that we can update uh, the parameters. You can see here that it gives rise to a fairly natural way of interacting with shape just by adding this notion of scale at which one wants to interact, where you can grab things like holes in a geometry and move it. I mean, moving a hole, so moving emptiness in a 3D shape is actually challenging because this involves things that you cannot differentiate, for instance, with uh, Boolean operations. Still, in practice, it works because we do not have only one point. We have a point and enti an entire scale around it to interact with the shape. 
Last, for the modeling part, before transitioning to rendering, uh, th there is another aspect of our work whose sole purpose is to actually establish a dialogue between different scale of the same shape. Uh, this topic is called uh, cage coordinate or space coordinates. That's something onto which we have invested a lot with my team over the years, for, for 15 years now. And that allows essentially to build a level of detail of a shape while maintaining a relationship to this shape. Uh, in other words, you can transfer edits and deformations and diffuse from the low resolution version of your shape toward the high resolution version one. Uh, this is known also as, like this problem is known also as a generalization of barycentric coordinate problem. Uh, you're, you're all familiar with barycentric coordinate on the triangle, mean value coordinate generalize that somehow to volumes bounded by uh, a surface, a, a triangle mesh as, a, as the boundary. And we developed over the years many schemes to actually uh, be able to express what would happen on the core simplification of a shape back to the original full resolution object. So that's what you see here. The user essentially interacts with the blue cage that is encompassing this car. And then the deformation is transferred only through coordinate reprojection to the original shape. Now, if you design your coordinate set well, it can come with fairly interesting properties, such as this work from SIGGRAPH last year called uh, quad green coordinates, where the deformation that occurs when you start transferring from the coarse to the high resolution model is what's called quasi-conformal, which means that locally the volume will be preserved. That's a property that is extremely interesting for natural interaction with, uh, with shape. Now, considering the audience, I couldn't conclude with something else than image synthesis. And let me uh, transition to the last part of this talk uh, about rendering, essentially, and some aspect of rendering which is related to what I was talking first. So there is one question after which we come back on a regular basis with my team, which is, where should we locate the geometric representation? Like, some people consider that a super high resolution mesh with vertex color, for instance, should, or vertex attribute, should be enough for pretty much any, any application we, we target. Some others are uh, extremely fan of texture mapping with uh, all the benefit of having mappable, tileable, random accessible content expressed as 2D maps that exist in the UV space. And I believe that a good system should be able to handle both. But what's sure is that level of detail and mip mapping is almost for free, not exactly for free, I have a last project to mention, but almost for free, when you deal with 2D maps. And if we can express a large part of the geometric content of a shape in its 2D maps, let's say displacement, normal map, uh, it's a big win, not only for uh, editing, but also for final usage of the, of the content. So let me focus on one aspect of it, which is the 8 map or displacement map, if you want. This is where you can locate really 95% of the geometric content of a complex asset, because as a 2D high resolution map, it can encode a large part of the geometric features of a shape, and you, you can be left with a fairly coarse domain to manipulate in 3D, actually. So we studied displacement mapping, and back then we were interested in uh, having super high quality displacement mapping, but in our GPU path tracer that we are developing at Adobe. And there was one, one challenge with that, which was the resolution with which our users were producing displacement maps. So in practice, those displacement maps exi exist at least at 4K resolution. And sometimes they are tiled 10 times. So the, this vi visualization of the displacement map is not really reflecting the complexity of it. The amount of detail that exists in this dis displacement map gives rise to the, the appearance that you see on the right. And it's not only about moving the geometry, it's about creating entire new light paths on the surface with shadowing effect and occlusions that either reveal or hide details and give this crisp, this crisp uh, appearance that is appealing to, for, for many users. So you can see here, with and without displacement mapping, and with the exact same rendering algorithm in the end, a GPU pass tracer, a Monte Carlo pass tracer, and uh, you see the benefit of reproducing them well. Now, as I was saying, those things are super high resolution. And uh, if you try to go the usual way and test late your mesh before building a BVH and then ray tracing that, very quickly you run out of memory, in particular when people tile stuff. I know I already talked about tiling, but believe me, this is like one of those things that break algorithm in practice in production that were perfectly working as long as tiling was not part of the game and that is actually so important for users, being able to tile content. This is very often how you expand the content that you created to entire worlds. So <clears throat> we came up with a solution called TFDM, or Tessellation Free Displacement Mapping, that essentially avoid any tessellation. 
And we did that by reversing a little bit the process. So you can see here the geometry of a, a simple 3D scene with like two triangles for the ground, a simple cylinder and two planes. And you can see the, the resulting rendering that you get with uh, TFDM and all the details that comes from the displacement map. The idea here was that instead of tessellating the base geometry before displacing it, what we would do would be to build the acceleration data structure in the texture space and then texture map the data structure on the core surface at rendering time. As a matter of fact, what it provides is that you have a per ray level of detail that is synthesized on the fly while, while tracing and that can be done up to the resolution of the text cell that you had in your displacement map and independently of the amount of tiling, for instance, that you had on the surface. So here is an example of what you typically get with equivalent budget when you first tessellate and then displace, then build your BVH and render, and when you use TFDM for the exact same task. So the benefit here is mostly on quality and memory consumption. In terms of speed, it remains an order of magnitude slower than uh, scenarios where you can actually build the BVH and where all of that fit in memory. But there is one scenario super important for us where that kind of solution is the only way to go. That's when the actual content of the displacement map is designed. As I said at the beginning, we work mostly for the 3D DCC pipeline where displacement mapping is not something that is fixed and then used on screen. It's actually something that people create while using our technologies. So one last aspect of it is that maybe on the contrary to neural alternatives, we have also colleagues working on neural alternatives to that kind of process, the only thing that we replace fundamentally is the uh, intersection test. So your shading model remains preserved, and you can use it as usual in your pipeline. Uh, it's compatible with uh, real-time editing for procedural content and parametric materials, as I was mentioning before. And here are a few examples of uh, result we get with this, uh, with this technique on uh, non-trivial displacement maps. As a side note, uh, many of our users are abusing displacement maps together with normal maps, and that also inspires us in pushing in this direction because we see that as soon as we provide them with powerful and efficient displacement mechanisms, they can do really crazy things. So low memory footprint runs entirely on the GPU and is uh, well adapted for uh, content editing when it comes to the, the displacement part of the, the displacement part, sorry, of the material model. Now, recently we had to address another problem uh, with actually Alban, who's, who's here somewhere, which relates to two other maps uh, present in the material model that we manipulate, uh, the roughness and normal. Maybe some of you are familiar with the, the term in industry called uh, roughness to normal transfer or normal to roughness transfer. Um, this arises typically when you try to meet map material models, where part of what was the mesostructure present in the normal map should now be expressed at a given MIP level in the roughness map. We came up with a solution called uh, MIPNet, which uh, we designed so that it could work with multiple shading models, and in particular, multiple microfacet NDFs. Uh, we experimented extensively with uh, GGX and Beckman, and found that the same neural architecture, the same neural filter, can, uh, with, with different weights, of course, can be used to actually downsample efficiently uh, normal and uh, roughness map. On the way, one, one specific aspect we focused on was the emergence of anisotropic roughness. Like typically, the distribution of normal and roughness value at, for a given patch on your material at a given scale might quickly become something extremely anisotropic. And you, detecting that and giving rise to this in, among the MIPS uh, was actually a challenge. We solved it by expressing it through a tensor, and actually what we somehow MIP map is a tensor, uh, that expressed the anisotropy of the material regarding its meso and micro uh, geometric structure. So this is the minimal architecture that was convincing. Two neural models, HA and HB, that are trained using a, a small differentiable uh, rendering engine to downsample the material maps and transfer content from the normal to the roughness, to the anisotropic roughness one. Why two models? Well, one model kicks HA here is a multilayer perceptron that kickstart the process, but only see two scales, very hard over four pixels to actually detect anisotropy. The second one, HB, actually has view on an extra scale that it makes the task of giving uh, birth to anisotropy much easier than uh, with a single model. Of course, we could think about like using more models like HC, HD to have larger and larger footprint and you know, uh, more vision over the different scales. 
But it turns out that it was enough to achieve a good result in a many practical scenario. So in the end, it's a, it's a simple neural map filter that does not involve any additional maps in your material model. Uh, for production reason, that was also an interesting aspect. Like you can use use it just as a drop-in replacement for your uh, favorite MIP map generation primitives. And it can be used in two modalities, either in its generalized form that was trained on a thousand materials, or when overfitting, uh, albeit with a lot of a lot more computation, for a single material when you want to maximize quality. And you can see here a few a few examples. All right, let me conclude. I've been trying to show you that across the DCC pipeline, the 3D DCC pipeline, level of details, approximation scheme, and multi-scale processing were, were, were play a, playing actually a, a major role. And that's my you know, take-home message uh, for today. Uh, level of details are everywhere and extremely interesting to study. That being said, I have the, the feeling that uh, there is untapped potential in many aspects of computer graphics that have not been map-mapped yet. And if you're looking for direction to explore, I would uh, encourage you to look into whatever happens in your pipeline, in your algorithm, in your process, other aspects of it that could benefit from a MIP mapping level of detail or approximation scheme. Another aspect that, that explains why I chose this topic for this talk, I have currently three, three slide decks so on different topics, but I, I picked up this one for, for this one uh, joint keynote, is that Level of detail and MIP mapping, multi-resolution processing and multi-scale analysis is pretty core to computer graphics science. We borrow, in computer graphics, we borrow a lot of notions from our friends in applied mathematics, signal processing, physics, biology, but preserving the appearance of a shape, building level of detail, efficient MIP maps on the GPU for geometry, light, material is something which is really core to this community and that's, there is a potential to disseminate some of our methodology to other sciences as well. I had a chance to work uh, a little bit over the years in biomedical engineering using graphics techniques that we developed for graphics purpose, but with another impact, another, another kind of outcome than the final image that we use in game and, and VFX. Interestingly also, these methods help establishing a dialogue with the other sciences. The example of the n-body problem, I'm sure some of you have worked on simulating an in the n-body problem uh, on a GPU, for instance, has created a lot of interaction between graphics and physics. And this happens in many other fields, including uh, material representation, the microfacet theory, and so on. Today, I presented only a fraction of the work we do in this space. If you're interested in more, uh, either regarding global illumination, granular rendering, uh, registration, 3D printing, and even HDR relating, please have a look to my, to my web page. I will conclude with three, three remarks, and I will uh, resurrect an old piece of work for the first one. Uh, the byproduct of approximation. This is an example of a simplification algorithm we designed about 10 years ago. The goal of the algorithm was to simplify a shape at extreme coarse levels. Doing so, we realized at some point that polygons, which are essentially two-dimensional two elements, were not enough to capture with a small amount of numbers a complex shape. So the idea we had with Jean-Marc Thierry and Emily Guy, two of my students back then, was to increase the dimensionality of our mesh with one dimension that would be the thickness. Hence, those spheres, which are actually vertices in four dimensions. Long story short, this is a simplification algorithm that was not meant to discover that this shape was made of four spheres, but that consistently performed extremely well at discovering simple geometric primitives in complex shapes. So we were not trying to target shape approximation with simple primitives, but as a byproduct of an efficient simplification mechanism that was meant to be level of details, we got something that actually beats most of the uh, simple shape detectors uh, out there. And the second notion I'd like to point is that, of course, I tried to steer you away from the obvious main benefit of level of detail, which is speed and, and scalability. Of course, this is the, the main reason why we usually use level of detail, mean maps, and so on. And if you push it far enough, uh, you get something like what we presented at HPG actually eight years ago. Uh, so think about the eight years old GPU and the problem of creating a, a simplification of a mesh. Here, 11 million triangles as input, 64,000 triangles as output, all of that in 46 milliseconds. When you design properly that kind of level of detail algorithms, somehow some geometric processing primitives are not pre-processing anymore. They can be processed that can be executed on the fly, which means that something that used to be something that you, you know, execute first, then store on disk, then reuse at some point, can be seen as just an, an, interf uh, an access interface 
uh, think about generating as many simplifications of a mesh as you have frame in a sequence of a real-time application. This is actually possible with a high performance level of details method. Last, and that's to, to call a recent piece of work, which is definitely not from us, but that I find extremely inspiring, uh, Monte Carlo geometry processing. Maybe you heard about this paper uh, three years ago at, at SIGGRAPH by uh, Sony and Crane. Um, I think this approach to geometry processing opens up what used to be a black box for many researchers. Geometry, pro geometry processing is often cast as the formalization of a system of equation and then the solving of the system. And the solving is often done with something which is a black box because most graphics researchers do not dig into the solver themselves to modify it for a particular execution scheme. Now, this is a much simpler approach that takes inspiration from Monte Carlo rendering, where everything is open. It's, uh, it's not a black box. It's extremely easy to get into the actual uh, solver, this Monte Carlo solver, and bring pieces from our expertise, level of details, approximation scheme, multi-resolution schemes. And so if you, like me, lie at the frontier between rendering and modeling, I think that this line of work is extremely interesting. I made a lot of effort to split my presentation into multiple components with material on one side, geometry on the other. Uh, this is both interesting and also a curse. Uh, if I show you those three pictures, maybe some of you would talk about materials, some others would talk about geometry. It really depends on you know, your current activities and uh, the, the kind of things you, you like to do in computer graphics. I would say that on the long run, uh, one of the objectives we will pursue will be to unify that and maybe stop having this split between how we represent appearance and how we represent shapes. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take questions. Thank you for the fantastic talk, Tommy. Fantastic. Are there questions to Tommy at this point? Yeah, thanks. Fantastic talk. Um, I just a quick question: where you were showing the car animation with the low, the low cage over that, as an old timer, what what's the difference between that and like the ancient freeform deformation um, operations? So the uh the 1986 Seagraph paper that described lattice deformation is using 3D lattice. So you have a regular 3D grid, and you can move like every vertices inside, and you get some local linear model that transfer the, the deformation to the, uh, to the volume, hence the high resolution mesh. What I in what I showed, this is what we call cage coordinates, where basically every point is in space is expressed as a set of coordinates that relate to all the vertices of the cage. That means that. Uh, First of all, you have as many coordinates as you have points in the control mesh. So that's, a, that's a pitfall. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you have long range effect and volume deformations uh, behavior that are much better than uh, when you just locally modify the, um, the, the, the vertices of a lattice in a freeform deformation. I can take, like, I can take a very simple example. If you, the, for the model we studied the, and introduced uh, for quads, the green coordinate model that was originally introduced by Lipman, you can create rotations out of cage vertex translations. That kind of behavior uh, is impossible to do with linear models. Oh, I, I thought the freeform deformation was like a, a either cubic or something like that. But yeah, even though it's a linear relationship between the space deformation and the vertex, vertices that you move. Okay. Right. Thank you. There's another question up there, please. <laughs> Run with I can through that path. There's someone who's going to get this. All right. So I. So, oh yeah. So I. So I'm. <clears throat> so of course I've seen that you have dealt with. So you thought you know it's like have that 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 displacement mapping, where you know where you have. So. I'm thinking, how much have you looked into combining it with Fong tessellation, where, the dis where it's a Fong tessellation that you're displacing, or just quadratic Bezier patches that are being displaced? Uh, we, we looked into not specifically Fong tessellation, but in general uh, subdivision substitutes. One thing we had in mind at some point was to um, bake in the Fong displacement, for instance, yeah. with the actual displacement map into a single model that would both smooth somehow 
and uh, add details uh, it, in the process. That seems like what you're doing with like those train figures you showed, like with that with that tank where it was smoothed. Seems like that's what you did to smooth out the, the effect of tacitly. That's what it looks like. like the oh, th that might be a. Uh, an effect that you perceive because of the displacement, but in this case, we didn't combine with... I know, uh, yeah, that's what I mean, the display. I think you, I presume you probably baked that smoothing into the displacement. That, that wasn't the case in, oh. in the examples we showed, but we want to do that because there are cases where it's important to do it, to, otherwise there are artifacts that appear. But actually, in practice, in those examples, that, that was never the case. Huh. <laughs> Good. Who wants uh -huh. the cube next? There's somebody here, please. All right. Yeah, hi, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, it's just like some meta question, like you gave examples uh, of how level of details can help for say shape and materials. What about illumination? Do you have any examples uh, where level of details can help for illumination modeling as well? Absolutely, actually with uh, Tobias and Elma, we've been working on that 10, 12 years ago maybe. Uh, Maybe you're familiar with the notion of light cuts uh, or VPLs. Um, th this is a way of modeling explicitly lighting in a, in a 3D scene and first bounce, for instance, for indirect lighting. And uh, we, we actually worked on that with Tobias. He was the, one of the main authors of a paper called Many LODs, where the idea was essentially to build a lot of level of details at once when shading a scene, a, a, a scene uh, for each uh, shading point. Uh, the idea was to... Uh, expand what's called point-based global illumination into the real-time realm. And that was extremely useful to actually build on the GPU in parallel fast level of details of a point clouds that was essentially here to lit the second bounce, the, the first bounce of indirect lighting. Okay. And there, like that's one example, but uh, there are many others. Uh, at some point we worked on HDR relating uh, of, of, re of uh, for uh, augmented reality and actually uh, using a 3D point cloud with HDR colors happened to be uh, the way to go. And it was obviously way too heavy to do that in real time. So we had to actually generate level of details on the fly to relight not from an IBL, but from an actual 3D object. And I could go on for like with 10 other examples. Actually, I didn't talk so much about lighting precisely because this is probably in the lighting world and in the rendering world that level of details have been explored the most over the last few years, in particular when it comes to radiance caching and, and this, this, uh, this line of research. Okay, thanks. We have time for one short further question. There's none, okay. So, well, there is, okay, sorry very much. <laughs> or speak up if it's... It's supposed to. Try right, again. Okay. Never mind. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, have you looked into uh, predicting displacement map that can be used to do some like texture um, transfer on different geometries? Predicting displacement map? Is that yes. What you're so, um, well, we have ongoing projects in this space uh, oh, I see. <laughs> that I can't really, can't really talk about. Uh, but definitely at some point when you see how efficient uh, uh, neural inspired methodologies are with uh, radiance caching or uh, even reflectance caching, uh, we definitely start to look into uh, what this means for the displacement part, the displacement content. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're out of time, I guess. Uh, Let's thank Tommy much, much, much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess there's a coffee session ahead.